so uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming. So I would like to start uh, our section on data analysis and machine learning uh, with a big thanks uh, to our host in Armenia. Uh, now Armenia going through hard and dark times and I would like to especially thank the host uh, for having the strength and courage to help us still organizing this event uh, at these hard times. So uh, my name is Evgeny Zimbalov and uh, I'm a, I have a PhD in computer science and uh, right now I'm a machine learning scientist in Aptec and together with uh, Dr. Maxim Panov from TII, Technology Institute uh, in UAI, uh, we will be chairing this session on data analysis and machine learning. Uh, this year we had around 17 submissions and only five made it to the final publications paper. Uh, a little bit of more, but uh, we would like to, uh, and unfortunately most of our speakers couldn't come for different reasons, so I would like uh, to thank the speaker who came for coming, and uh, now we will be having a first uh, offline talk. Oh, I can read it from there. So uh, is, is it about detecting design patterns in Android applications with Codebird embeddings and CK metrics? And authors are Jinjwe Lamini, As Ahmad Usman, Leonel Karkwang, and Vladimir Ivanov. Uh, please thank our offline presenter. Uh, so, limited time, but uh, nevertheless, the topic is uh, uh, fascinating for me. And uh, But uh, first of all, a couple of words about why I'm working, working in this direction. I'm head of the lab, uh, of the NLP lab for software engineering in Annapolis University, and we have a big contract uh, supported by Russian government in like uh, seven years uh, to develop tools for software engineering automation, for generative models and generative AI applied in software engineering domain specifically. And especially my lab is focused on code and text representation for understanding of code, source code, and for summarization and similar tasks. Uh, and analysis of the textual information. And this talk is uh, uh, about, motivated by uh, specific uh, problems that software engineers, but not only software engineers, but some managers of software projects uh, may have in real life. So uh, uh, many applications are being developed. They uh, just stored somewhere, but uh, sometimes managers uh, of the program managers or project managers, they have this uh, trouble with managing, with uh, understanding what is the, uh, if, the if the requirements, if the structure of the project specifically, we will talk about Android applications here, uh, follow some predefined uh, agreements about the architecture, about the design, about the patterns that uh, developers agreed to use uh, when they develop the implement the system. And uh, the motivation of this talk is that, uh, well, uh, we can try to uh, solve this task at least partially using the machine learning tools and there are typical design patterns, arch architectural design patterns on the right of this, uh, on the right part of this slide. Uh, raise your hand if you don't know what is MVC, MVP, MVVM. Uh, well, basically they are different approaches to uh, splitting the internal part of the application in Android, like uh, splitting the visualization part from the data management part from the uh, modeling part and uh, making these three parts decoupled in order to uh, do the development, software development more uh, easy, robust, and so on, and maintainable. So classical uh, metrics for source code, uh, they used uh, like back maybe 20 years, more than 20 years, 30 years before to analyze what is going on in the software um, and basically they extract some information. We'll talk about the object-oriented programming here and it's well-known approach called uh, CK metrics when they can be calculated almost from any piece of object-oriented code. Uh, they deal with the structure, the methods and the classes, how they're organized, how many uh, methods in the class and so on and so forth. And this, these metrics are widely employed also in pattern detection, not just uh, 
for some uh, quality of the code, but also to detect patterns. There are approaches, I will not uh, spend too much time for this, but uh, uh, there are approaches that are devoted to analysis of the byte court. If we discuss Android applications, there are approaches of analysis of the semantic features related to the uh, source code, like training a word to vec model to extract some semantic features from the source uh, and then uh, put them into the embedding of the, uh, uh, in the form of the embedding and then um, make a decision about the, train a classifier based on this word to vec uh, representation. And yeah, and there is a third approach like using the CK metrics only. Now you know what is a CK metric. So you run through the project, calculate all the CK metrics for the classes, and then make decision about the, uh, the pattern. Our research questions uh, was related to these two things. Like the first one, is it uh, actually uh, important to add something on top of the CK metrics? If, the, if it is possible to uh, use a pre-trained uh, machine, le machine learning model, uh, that will extract features uh, that know something about source code, many projects, and extract features on, on top of the CK metrics that, that will be useful. And um, if it is possible to improve, then how well such model should work. And uh, I'll talk about these two contributions, basically the approach. But that is very simple. Maybe you will have some questions in the end, but uh, it's not that uh, hard to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, the analysis of the embeddings, classical features, if they're useful for the pattern. Uh, so the methodology is uh, uh, a bit complicated on this picture, if you, if you take a look. Uh, this picture may be a bit complicated, but nothing, nothing fancy is happening. You have a project of your application that is Android application, many Java files. You can calculate CK metrics, and then you can calculate the embeddings that uh, represent, represent representations, the vectors uh, that uh, um, correspond to each file. So for each Java file, this pre-trained model outputs a, a fixed uh, size vector, and then. The second step is to pull, to combine, aggregate those vectors into one, one single vector, basically. And then, again, train a classifier on top of this. So we have this first path using only the CK metrics, and the second path from these source files, uh, application of the CodeBird model uh, that is extracting the features, like the uh, big deep learning model that extracts features, uh, and then, um, we can concatenate two, two, two types of uh, features and then decide uh, either using both of them or only CK metrics. Uh, for the classification part, we use the uh, cut boost, that is a, a state of the art model. The thing is that um, here we don't train, we cannot train basically this part, but, but usual approach is uh, fine tune the code bird or some kind of a transformer that extracts features here. But here we don't have enough uh, data for training and that's what the idea why, why we don't, we just use the pre-trained frozen uh, layers of convert. Okay, just to show the whole process step by step. So these metrics representing the uh, one source file uh, ends up in one uh, long list of numbers, each number corresponding to a specific metric, and then you have this array of metrics, uh, like around 10 or maybe 20. Um, that's actually, yeah, actually actually more because we use a extended package, it's 82 metrics. And uh, our hypothesis is that these, these, uh, these uh, metrics actually they kind of uh, uniquely uh, identify some object oriented part and they measure complexity of the design part of the design of the project of the design of this class or whatever the source code is and they can capture some course level metrics related to uh, course level uh, patterns that are related to uh, the target task 
For the code birth embeddings, I ha haven't, uh, said, uh, haven't said too much about this, but the code bird, maybe you heard about bird, the pre-trained model from Google, that is kind of, yeah. And uh, the code bird is actually similar idea, but the, uh, the same, almost the same architecture, but pre-trained on the huge corpus of source code. Instead of the Wikipedia and some internet corpus, they use the a huge, like basically all GitHub, something like this, and they pre-train and predict the like the, the, uh, pre -pre train the multi uh, mass language model on this data, and then you have this model that is, um, of course, it's not the state of the art right now, but uh, it's still a kind of application of natural language methods in software engineering world to extract some information from the source code, okay? And it seems that this, uh, it's again, it's just a hypothesis, but uh, this uh, may capture on the uh, patterns on the fine level, uh, f uh, more fine level uh, than CK metrics because this captures the token representation. And uh, But the problem here is that for each file, you have uh, a list of kind of documents for, for each file, you have set of uh, representations. And the, the question is, how do you uh, combine them? The, the idea is to, we tested several ideas like of pooling, of aggregation, like measuring the maximum, measure, measuring the average. Uh, it, it ended up that we use, we use for the max pooling, we used the maximum or not maximum, but summation of all these values and that was uh, get uh, we get better results with this approach. About the experimentation, so this methodology again just gets the data and the question about wh where we get the data. The data is coming from the repository of uh, like uh, the, the already annotated data set with a pattern labels. So we have it's it's very small data anyway, uh, 26 like and uh, 22 numbers. 22 projects that are uh, doesn't have any design pattern. Uh, but still it's, uh, uh, if you don't consider training, if you consider only the testing part, it's, uh, it's doable to uh, apply this methodology if, uh, on the on, 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 in, the, in, in the testing mode. Okay. Um, so there's the data set. I discussed a bit the cut boost already. Uh, just the hyperparameters, you can find them in paper, of course. And uh, yeah, we calculated the classification me measures, classification, classification uh, metrics to evaluate the quality, of course. And five-fold five cross-validation was used, was used because we have um, you know, diverse in the classes somewhat somewhat imbalanced, but not really a uh, huge imbalance, but still we can sample from the data and uh, calculate the error. Uh, the results here, the, the first uh, table shows not very uh, uh, fascinating results, but still it's, uh, for some patterns, it uh, achieves better results than the original paper on the coach and uh, that actually compares the CK metrics only and model that combines metrics. So you can see that the, for some patterns, there is a like a drop of the quality, so some the same, but uh, so in most cases, uh, it's, uh, uh, this is the improvement and this is also a slight improvement. It can be considered as improvement. Uh, again, it's, uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic about these numbers because it's still far from uh, good quality anyway. So that's, um, uh, and, and here we, comp we compare this uh, regarding the pattern type here. We compare the, how the CK metrics compared to Codebird metrics, uh, Codebird embeddings plus CK. So in most cases, you can see that the improvement over the plain uh, CK uh, metrics without any uh, embeddings is uh, like outperformed by uh, embeddings here, but sometimes you, you have this uh, example here that is uh, CK metrics is better. 
in this case. Uh, okay, and uh, so discussion about the, our initial research questions. So we also analyzed the importances of different metrics, and this is a kind of when it comes to the practical application. So you can, uh, you can train a model, you can train a cut boost model that will predict the classes uh, or the design patterns. But when it comes to real world, to practice, it's uh, more, more important to uh, get some interpretation uh, why the model predicts this or that. So here, the, the interpretation about the, uh, this part of the work was about the finding the top five metrics that contribute to decision. And they actually, uh, there, there is analysis that uh, like confirms that the, uh, some of the metrics, some of the, those 80, 82 metrics are actually not relevant for, uh, not responsible for the design pattern. But this, uh, the, the, these metrics that you should, or you as a manager should pay attention to, uh, whatever you use machine learning or don't use machine learning, you can compute these metrics from the uh, source code for, from the project and say, okay, this is uh, like a, a indicator of this or that design pattern or the absence of some design pattern. I will not uh, go deep because it's uh, kind of related to uh, domain knowledge here and you should be a kind of developer in Android or a developer in, uh, to understand all what, what does it mean and uh, maybe it's not that uh, interesting. Uh, the improvement that ML gives us uh, on top of the CK metric, as I said, it's not that uh, big and we call it moderate. You can say it's maybe not even an improvement, but it opens a, a big question about the uh, applicability of machine learning, of that kind of models uh, in machine, of machine learning in source code analysis. It shows clearly that it's not easy task. The current models that uh, like large language models applied to code also struggle with the uh, analysis of bigger contexts, big uh, uh, large context, large uh, projects and so on. They usually process like uh, function level or class level um, context size. And uh, it's still it's still open question, it's still uh, ongoing research. And um, I'll conclude with these uh, limitations. So the major limitations, of course, limitation is the size of the data, of course, and uh, the interpretability of the embeddings themselves, which is just a list of uh, numbers. And if you, if you talk about the interpretation of this list of numbers, it's not that useful because um, when you use CK metrics, at least they mean something. But when you consider the uh, BERT embeddings, they may be less uh, meaningful. So we are going to continue this work and uh, develop more robust and uh, interpretable approach and uh, uh, do the ablation study without without the dimensionality reduction that was maybe uh, uh, for the sake of the performance, we reduced the dimensionality of embeddings, but maybe we can try to do this uh, in a more regular or more granular basis to understand the exact impact of Codebert. Uh, do I have time? One minute? Okay, so it's just conclusion. You can find code and source code and data here. Uh, this work was supported by Ra Russian Science Foundation and uh, uh, was done at Nantopolis University and uh, I'm uh, ready to ask, uh, answer any questions on this. Okay. Uh, thanks for your uh, really interesting talk. So it, it's going to be more and more code and we need to process it on a more automated way to make it work. Uh, so uh, the preference now is for uh, offline uh, uh, participants to ask questions. Do you have any question? Anyone on the room? Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, please use the microphone so our online speakers will also hear us. 
it's, working. it's for online speakers. Uh, I want to just to ask: uh, Is CodeBird available only in one size? Uh, you mean the uh, input, the size of the? I mean the size of the model. Yeah. Uh, the model, right? Uh, the number of parameters. So the question is about number of parameters. I I think the CodeBird is. Uh, we use only one set of parameters, like one pre-trained model. The, it's not like uh, the bird itself, like it comes into several sizes, uh, small, uh, large, and so on. But the problem here is uh, maybe not the number of parameters because it's not a big number anyway, comparing to large language models, uh, the modern. But the problem here is the input uh, length. So, so it's const risk constraint uh, with 512 tokens and it, if you want to process the whole project, you should squeeze this, all these source files into 512 tokens, some of them just too big. So we cut all the uh, comments, uh, cut some unnecessary, so, so there was a preprocessing stage to feed, and even if you cut some of the files, they are still not fit into the input of the code bird. So that's, that's another limitation, another problem of this approach. So one idea could be to move to the bigger models that actually have a larger input uh, window, uh, size of the input context. That could help and, uh, or just switch to some, princi in principle, different uh, models that can process the whole repository, not just file by file. Uh, did I answer your question? Any questions? Thank you for your presentation. Uh, so it's not of a question, but more of a, well, like I want to discuss a little bit. So I think uh, it would be cool if your work, uh, uh, if uh, you'll extend your work in uh, finding the anti-patterns in code. And uh, well, uh, I think that might be helpful well, when, uh, if there is uh, well, such a system created to, well, as a software developer, I say that uh, when uh, a new code is uh, published and changed, then some uh, changes in the pattern appear. And so not like, uh, and to not, not to measure the whole pattern on the project, but maybe like in a, a small uh, part, of the code compared to the whole project, I think. A good suggestion, thank you. And uh, yeah, there are such works like for classifying the uh, anti-patterns, finding the anti-patterns in the source code. And uh, like you, uh, as I understand your suggestion was uh, classifying of the commits that can break some pattern and that's it. Uh, yeah, there, there are such works and definitely it's uh, beginning and um, Back to the first slide about the Anopolis group. And yeah, actually we have not only my lab in Anopolis who's working on this, but other people are trying to uh, approach different problems. In uh, like, uh, these times it's, it's a bit hard to like, even to find the uh, ID, <laughs> good ID <laughs> that will be available. And, uh, but uh, so the, 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 there is a number of uh, problems of course for practice and for research um, but yeah thank you for yeah suggestion it was not a question <laughs> uh, are there any questions from the zoom meetings uh, are there okay we don't really have any uh, time uh, for that so let's thank the speaker again for the talk yes uh, and uh, uh, the following talks will be uh, unfortunately held online uh, and our next uh, uh, talk is uh, a data-driven approach for identifying functional state of hemodialysis <coughs> fistulas, entropy complexity and formal concept analysis by Yekaterina Zvorikina, Yuri Bishasnov, Mayit Sovradvi un, uh, and uh, Vasily Gromov. So, um, they will be talking via Zoom, so please, uh, dear mm. online speakers, uh, share your screen or report mm. to me if you have any problems with that. Uh, you have 18 minutes uh, uh, for the talk and seven minutes for the question. Thanks. 
I would like to give some context about what's uh, the problem with the artery venous fistula first. Uh, so, as you know, chronic venous diseases are the most co common pathologies uh, uh, that we have now in uh, humans. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a big occurrence of AI methods used for uh, diagnosing these uh, problems. Uh, in our work, we decided to tackle uh, this um, a big issue only for one group of uh, people with a chronic uh, kidney um, failure disease, uh, especially in dialysis patients. Uh, the prevalence of this uh, chronic renal failure in these patients uh, is growing now, especially after COVID pandemic, uh, because uh, people who are going to dialysis, they're um, facing many issues. Uh, and if they cannot uh, go to the hospital in timely manner and have um, uh, to stay in unbuilder conditions, uh, it of course results in uh, many other issues. Uh, so what is this artery venous fistula? It is um, a special um, uh, insert into the vessel, into the blood vessels in their hand of uh, dialysis patients, uh, which helps them to maintain the uh, always available um, vessel to uh, provide the dialysis procedures. Uh, so it's a small tube that comes uh, into artery and uh, vein uh, and uh, stays there uh, for some time. Uh, while the patient has dialysis, so it can be four years. Uh, it's a very uh, uh, well-researched um, method. It's, uh, it has very good results uh, in uh, dialysis. But the main problem with this issue is that uh, the patients uh, uh, can get thrombosis through this uh, small channel. Uh, because, of course, it's not a natural uh, vessel. That's why yeah, it's easy to get some toxic waste from other cells and also yeah, to get the basic thrombosis, especially in older and elderly uh, patients. And uh, the issue for the patient is that uh, when he stays at home, the development of this condition can be very fast, for example, in a few hours or one day. And uh, he cannot diagnose it by himself and uh, it can lead to lethal conditions. But the good thing is that uh, this um, uh, fistula uh, makes a very um, characteristic sound that is called the brood. Uh, and uh, usually doctors, uh, when the patient visits them uh, for the analysis, they also check how is the sound of this uh, uh, small channel. And uh, uh, yeah, the sound is a, a result of um, yeah, the blood going through through it. That's why it uh, uh, resembles a bit uh, the heartbeat, but uh, of course a bit different, uh, like a pulse. And uh, usually the uh, experienced doctor can uh, easily diagnose if uh, something is wrong and uh, if uh, the patient needs uh, uh, the replacement of this channel. But of course, in uh, many situations, we're not living in an ideal world. That's why the patient cannot go to doctor every day. And uh, as I said, uh, yeah, this, uh, can develop, this condition can develop uh, very fast uh, in any time. Uh, that's why uh, we decided to use uh, some uh, mathematical, uh, mathematical approaches uh, to tackle this issue. Uh, and in this study, we analyzed uh, 290 patients uh, from different uh, sites in Russia uh, and uh, uh, used uh, uh, the help of the doctors to analyze them. Uh, so our motivation was to propose uh, two mathematical methods of analyzing this fistula brood uh, sounds as a time series uh, and uh, try to distinguish uh, them in the, on the basis of the fact that uh, uh, we think that normal functioning fistula makes uh, the um, sound of um, uh, laminar blood flow that is normal. And if it's a pathology, it's close to turbulent flow. And uh, yeah, we can easily distinguish these two things. Uh, during this project, we uh, decided to first, uh, of course, investigate uh, existing approaches, then uh, calculate uh, yeah, our methods, which will be an overlay of entropy and complexity metrics uh, of each sample on entropy complexity plane, and then uh, apply two different clustering methods to classify the results of these uh, two metrics. And of course, uh, interpret our results and compare to the real situation that was given us by the uh, medical professionals. Uh, so how uh, do we see how they look like uh, this fistula brood noises? If it's a normal fistula, we can see that it's more or less uh, uh, non-chaotic time series. And if it's a pathological one, it looks uh, very different. Uh, 
Uh, in our case, unfortunately, we had, uh, yeah, for us, unfortunately, but for patients, of course, uh, it was very well, that most of the patients uh, had the normal uh, fistula sounds, uh, only 50 patients out of uh, yeah, 700 records had dysfunction in fistula. And also we had a 61 case when the doctors were not sure uh, if uh, it's a pathology or not. Uh, of course, for the doctor, it's easy. He can see the patient the uh, next day and decide uh, if something is wrong or not. So for us, it wasn't so easy, but uh, yeah, this is the problem of the method. Uh, analyzing uh, these noises, we also decided to go with a short uh, element of sound uh, because we don't see a big difference in, uh, yeah, in the results of our methods, if we take a very long time series, uh, long record or not. Uh, for entropy complexity analysis, we use uh, and, uh, Shannon entropy and uh, uh, Jen Jensen Shannon uh, divergence for complexity. Uh, then we used a very famous Wishart clustering algorithm uh, to cluster the results. So for each uh, time series, we uh, uh, we gave uh, we assigned uh, two metrics, entropy and complexity, and then yeah, basically clusterize them on the plane. Uh, another approach uh, included attribute object uh, graph uh, construction based on uh, the same two metrics and uh, time series. For each time series, uh, we uh, tried to um, uh, make it uh, as a binary matrix uh, based on the um, the uh, record, based on the analysis. And then this binary matrix uh, was um, um, reorganized to attribute object graph, where each uh, element was an object. And for each object, we checked uh, if this uh, binary matrix uh, values um, yeah, were aligned. And uh, this is a simpler um, example of such a graph. We, here we have one, two, three, I think six objects. I will show later how it looks for the, um, the time series that we actually used and it will be uh, yeah, much bigger, but uh, yeah, less uh, easy to follow how it works. Um, so the, um, yeah, the most interesting part, the results. For the um, first method for entropy complexity analysis, this is how our um, uh, clustering results look like. And uh, we can easily see that there are uh, three groups of clusters. Uh, here, if the uh, complexity and entropy are low, of course, we think that uh, this is um, a very organized uh, non-chaotic time series, and uh, we think that this still works well. Uh, then the yellow uh, cluster means uh, high complexity and high entropy. So this is a very chaotic time series, and we think that this still is malfunctioning. And uh, we have a relatively uh, big... Um, a uh, cluster in the middle, uh, which we consider is, uh, yeah, uh, we cannot uh, give a, a certain answer if it's uh, working or non-working fistula. And uh, yeah, this uh, cluster is uh, yeah, the uh, question for the next part of our work, how we can analyze this uh, data. Also, we, get, we got a very small cluster in the top where complexity and entropy is um, very, very, low, very, very high. And uh, yeah, I think this is uh, uh, due to uh, the uh, bad uh, recording of the uh, pistol sound because it's uh, recorded by a dictaphone or a microphone. Uh, and usually doctors speak during this procedure. That's why yeah, sometimes you cannot eliminate this uh, sound. Uh, for the object attribute approach, uh, these are the uh, clusters that we got. And uh, as you can see, if it's an organized time series, uh, we have very nice uh, scheme. And uh, if it's not organized, it's uh, looked uh, more like a mess because um, most of the um, objects, almost of the clusters, they had uh, a lot aligned. And uh, yeah, this is considered as, a, yeah, the right one is considered as a bad one. Also, we tried to show how it can look in an XY plane, so it's easy to follow. And in this case, uh, this method actually gave a better, uh, more distinguishable results. Uh, we can see that uh, yeah, there are two clusters, which is good. Uh, one means uh, yeah, uh, healthy uh, fistulas, and another one means uh, that yeah, the patient should go to the doctor. And these two methods, uh, they aligned, but uh, yeah, the question is uh, how we can interpret the uh, third the cluster that uh, is not uh, very chaotic and not very organized and uh, why we don't see it here. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, when we tried to combine this, uh, the results of two methods uh, by simple linear regression, we got, uh, I think, five clusters, uh, but still uh, the tendency uh, looks the same. Uh, we can uh, distinguish chaotic and organized uh, time series quite well, but we have a very big uh, cluster, a uh, few, a few ones actually in the middle that can be uh, that we cannot assign if they're healthy or not. Uh, which also, uh, after the talk with the doctors, aligns with the reality because they also cannot sometimes uh, analyze uh, and assign uh, and diagnose uh, the these patients. Uh, yeah, when we compared our results, uh, yeah, with uh, the doctor's analysis, yeah, we got uh, pretty much alignment, even though we had uh, less than three hundred uh, samples to to discuss with them. Uh, so, as a conclusion, I can say that uh, we developed these uh, two uh, new methods of not only time series analysis, but also diagnostics for fistula root sound. Uh, both of these approaches uh, were uh, good and aligned with the doctors in individually and in combination. Uh, and uh, yeah, we have uh, observed a significant correlation between the classification results. Um, and uh, uh, also we compared it with uh, not only doctor's analysis, but also with uh, some Doppler ultrasound for some patients. And uh, yeah, it worked well. Uh, regarding the limitations of the study, of course, it's relatively small sample size of patients, less than 300. Also, the data was anonymized. That's why we couldn't uh, compare, uh, for example, female and male patients. We couldn't know if they are overweight or not, which can also result in uh, some different sounds. Also, there were, uh, yeah, we don't know if they're uh, yeah, the age of the patient that can also be a big difference. And uh, yeah, we uh, it's a, still a black box for us. We cannot uh, uh, yeah consider if the, our uh, clusters are the, the same functional categories that the doctors are assigning to the patients. Uh, for the future development of this project, our perspectives are, of course, uh, have a, a bigger uh, sample group, also know more about uh, the patients, uh, maybe the age uh, or the weight or some other comorbidities that uh, they're having, for example, some uh, uh, comorbid illness. Uh, also, uh, for uh, during the fistula uh, construction, uh, uh, fistula procedure, uh, the fistula first months, it, it has um, undergone through a few stages of growth. And we can also uh, assume that the third cluster that we see in the middle can be due to the fistula is still how the doctors call it, Yan. And that's why we cannot uh, compare it with other fistulas. And uh, that's why yeah, our method can also help to see if the uh, post-operative fistula will be healthy and will work uh, for a long time, or the patient has to uh, have another operation soon. Um, that's it. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Okay. Uh, thank you, Yekaterina. Uh, special thanks from me as a chair. So you like uh, made it in uh, less than 14 minutes, so we could <laughs> try to keep on track. Uh, are there any questions from the uh, offline? Yes, uh, okay, I'll start uh, with you, uh, with Dimitri. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much for your work. Uh, I'm especially happy that you used formal concept analysis since this is one of our favorite topics um, in our department, for example. And the question is about clustering. Mm -hmm. Whenever you use formal concepts and concept lattices, they're like big search spaces rather than single clustering. What kind of selection tools to find a good clustering, a good partition you use here? Can you comment on it? Um, yeah, let me come back to the clusters. Uh, yeah, actually, we didn't develop any new one. Uh, we used already described another articles. Uh, yeah, the only uh, thing that, uh, yeah, I think we, yeah. 
we only use the extra tool to go through the uh, alignments of uh, different objects they let it through the lattices a second time uh, just to see if they are combined to um, more objects or not so it looks more like heuristic way to extract mm -hmm. a good clustering yeah, yeah. Oh, even okay. I, I must say that even brute force was faster uh, to go through the lattices than any other methods uh, yeah we used it only because it was faster for us in this case uh, let me allow one more comment mm -hmm beginning of millennium I was also a part of an international dialysis center working as a system administrator and I uh, remember those people who took these procedures three times per week it's mm -hmm. very important to uh, to support their lives and one more comment from uh, Jaume Bacherie uh, the program committee member he had uh, some relatives who also passed away and he support your work very much. Thank you. Yes, thanks. It's great to hear. It's uh, not useless. <laughs> thank you, Dmitry. Uh, thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have actually a couple questions. The, the first maybe to figure out uh, this clustering was done because you don't have uh, the ground through labels of the samples or am I missing something because on the on the screenshot on, on the slide you have labels mm -hmm. like zero and one mm -hmm. why, uh, why you the question is why don't you try it as a supervised uh, problem uh, because here we wanted to try uh, even for this analysis what uh, would better to use uh, is uh, not clusterization and classification as mo most of the <laughs> people who work in healthcare um, AI I think but uh, here we decided to try the clustering because we were not sure how many clusters we will get uh, in the first place uh, here yes we can see the two clusters but uh, uh, we also would uh, be happy to see more than two. And uh, if I analyze more data, and for example, if I take uh, yeah, another batch uh, with uh, yeah, the uh, patients from, for example, different hospital sites, it can be more than uh, two clusters. And here we are very cautious about uh, uh, given uh, um, labels because we are not also sure if uh, it's um, uh, either these clusters are for health and non-health patient or just uh, chaotic, non-chaotic time series. Okay, uh, thank you. And the second question, uh, as I understand, you analyze time series mm -hmm. and uh, the time series comes from the sound. Am I correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, um, oh, is it yeah. a sound wave like amplitude or was it... Uh, yeah, it's like a, an amplitude. So usually it's uh, just a sound from the microphone, uh, just a record, and then we okay. uh, then uh, review question... it as amplitude. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But my question then, uh, have you pre-processed it or transformed it on frequency domain? And if you didn't do this, why? Maybe there is some motivation behind this analysis of the uh, like uh, pure uh, amplitude data in your case. Uh, but, but usually it's like uh, people transform it into frequency domain, like doing some preprocessing. Uh, yeah, we, uh, the only things we did, it was just uh, uh, trying to clean up the sound with the different methods. But even after cleaning up, uh, it didn't help uh, very well uh, because the, uh, the sounds were made by uh, the records were made by different doctors in different conditions. That's why if we try to make it ideally clean, then we lose the actual sound. Uh, and uh, other methods, uh, yeah, if we try to make it 20% uh, yeah, cleaner, then uh, there is no change in the results. And uh, but yeah, I, I appreciate this idea. We should try to uh, analyze it as a frequency domains. Yeah, it's a kind of classical approach if you are. Mm -hmm want to clusterize or classify sound it's, uh, maybe it's worth to try at least mm -hmm. to convert to frequencies okay anyway thank you very much thanks yeah thank you are there any questions from the online okay uh it seems like we don't have any questions from the zoom any questions offline no? Okay, so let's thank the Ekaterina again for her talk. And um, the next... Yeah, thank you. 
the next talk uh, is an application of dynamic graph CNN and if ICP for detection and research archaeology sites by Alexander uh, Vachmintsev, uh, Olga Christodula, Andrei Melnikov, and Matvey Romanov. Dear presenters, are you here? Uh, yes, we see some screen sharing. Добрый день, уважаемые коллеги. Да, со мной случилась такая достаточно неприятная история. Перед конференцией я заболел, оказалось, что это какой-то редкий вариант коронавируса. Пришлось сохранять билет. Uh, could I please ask you to, we have an international conference and like some of the speakers, they don't understand Russian. Could you please switch to вот Как раз таки одна из проблем, которая возникла, что мне вот главный врач разрешил ограниченное участие в конференции принять. Ну и в том числе вот у нас какие-то теперь в военных госпиталях такие требования, что... Не разрешили мне делать доклад на английском. Вот если простите, то можно будет в таком формате выступить? Yes, yeah, so forbidden to speak English, yes, by doctor, yes, uh, yes, kind of uh, not clear, yeah, unfortunately, we really do some of the speakers not understanding Russian, maybe we could switch it to the end of the talk. So, uh, yes, so uh, if we could please then uh, make uh, uh, your presentation then the, uh, the last one. Uh, so uh, the, the, the people uh, who are uh, not really prepared to, um, you know, to uh, hear for the report in Russian uh, could uh, like stay uh, after, uh, so they, they could uh, actually like left to other section and stuff, so we couldn't like waste their time. Uh, would this be acceptable for you, please? Далеко не все смогут, да, прослушать, насколько я понял, да? Да, к сожалению, да, тут не все говорят по-русски. И если можно, давайте мы вас последним поставим, и тогда все интересы будут учтены. Окей, thank you so so much for understanding. So uh, I, I should ask Vladimir Belikov, who is the next, uh, yeah, could you please stop sharing the screen then? Uh, would ask uh, Vladimir Belikov, who is the next, oh, we have, we have a second offline. Yeah, could you please have an applause because, yeah. Uh, Dear colleagues, <coughs> let me introduce my presentation on some combination of clustering, uh, ensemble models, and domain adaptation of transfer learning. So uh, what is transfer learning, or sometimes called domain adaptation? So we have two domains. The first domain is uh, so-called target domain, or domain of interest. And uh, Besides that, we have some additional information or source domain. For example, we uh, have text in English uh, and we can use this information to improve classification or clustering of text in German on some related language. There are different kinds of transfer learning, supervised or weekly supervised, depending on the labeling process. So some data may be incompletely labeling or imprecisely labeled, so on. And in this work, we consider so-called heterogeneous transfer learning, when the domain have quite, quite different feature space information. So we have target domain, and it is required to obtain a partition of this data set on some number of clusters. Uh, and 
additional information is source domain, where objects are described in different feature space with different feature dimensionality. So source domain is labeled, and, and we uh, should perform clustering of target domain. Uh, and, and this hypothesis that the domains have uh, something common in their structure, some common regularities, and these regularities can be revealed by cluster analysis and used as additional information to improve clustering. What means by improving, we shall discuss later. <coughs> so we use cluster ensemble methodology when we have a number of clustering results and we combine them to obtain some consensus variant of partitioning. And there are some uh, known works on this problem, but these works have uh, some limitations. For example, uh, they consider common feature spaces or the time complexity is very hard of cubic complexity and is too much for many applications. Or we should have multiple domains, additional domains or source domains. Uh, these domains are not easily found in practice. And we propose methods which uh, have four, different, uh, four basic uh, stages. The first one is independent analysis of data, so we perform clustering of both source and target domain in parallel or independently. We use uh, lower end representation of uh, obtained similarity matrix to decrease computational cost. The next stage is extraction of knowledge. We use uh, some supervised classification algorithm and find the uh, classifier for prediction of the elements of co-association matrix in source data, because we know labeling in source data, and transfer them to target data using so-called meta-features. Meta-features are features with, which describe some common regularities in data structure. For example, number of clusters or form of clusters or some characteristics of the form and they don't, do not depend on initial feature spaces. Then we uh, use the found regularities to predict uh, causation matrix in target domain and perform on the last step, final clustering, we construct the partition of target data using the predicted causation matrix. <coughs> A few words about ensemble cluster, cluster, clustering. Here you can see uh, some example. We have uh, several partitions of data obtained by different algorithm or by one algorithm with different initializations or different working parameters and so on. Then we update average co-association matrix. Uh, each element is the frequency of uh, for a given pair pair of objects a frequency of falling to the same cluster. And then we, using, using this metrics, we find a consensus partition using some algorithm which uh, takes this information about similarities in the objects. For example, hierarchical clustering algorithm, or spectral clustering, and so on. Uh, this matrix, or co-association matrix, can be represented in a low rank form using rectangular matrices or association matrices and this gives uh, uh, significant uh, memory savings or computational savings because it's not necessary to uh, save in memory a large quadratic matrix for example million by million is a huge number of elements the steps of the algorithm are shown here. So uh, we perform 
independent analysis of source and tangent data using this algorithm and use uh, spectral clustering for uh, lower rank represented metrics of similarities. Uh, now, some previous papers we uh, have <clears throat> considered some probabilistic properties of cluster ensembles. Ensembles. So, if we suppose that there exists like, some ground truth uh, variable uh, that determines for each pair if, if it belongs to the same cluster or different clusters, and we uh, can define the conditional probability of classification error, and it is possible to use uh, some regularity assumptions, probabilistic assumptions, to prove that the algorithm, the classification error converges to zero when the size of the ensemble grows. And other things being integral, uh, diversity in the ensemble uh, gives the smaller error. However, in practice, some uh, or many or all, or all violations or all uh, assumptions can be violated. So we have, for example, some uh, we have not much memory and so on. So uh, for uh, for small number of ensemble members, we use additional data, source data, to improve the clustering results. Uh, as meta features, first of all, we use frequencies of the assignment of objects into the same clusters uh, or elements of co-association matrices from source and target domain. Then we use uh, meta feature based on uh, silhouette index. It's uh, well established. Uh, index uh, internal cluster and index, and we define it. Uh, for each pair of objects and use its additional information. Uh, then we calculate uh, coincidence matrix or co-association co matrix and find the decision function or classifier for predicted elements of the matrix dependent on the meta features used. Uh, we can use machine learning algorithms such as random forest, support with a machine, or artificial neural networks, and so on. Uh, some well known techniques can be used to uh, evaluate the performance of the quality of the classifier or find important meta features. And then it's possible to transfer the found classifier to the target domain for predicting the association matrix. And the final step is clustering based on the uh, predicted matrix. But uh, there are some problem that this matrix cannot be directly used for clustering because uh, some metric properties can be violated for uh, this matrix. So we uh, apply an approxi approximate solution. We start from some initial partition of data, of target data, and then migrate different points to another clusters to uh, get the best improvement of the criteria. Uh, this is the steps of the algorithm. Uh, so they, they perform three or four, four uh, stages of the algorithm, independent analysis, finding meta features, uh, finding classifier and transfer, transferring the classifier from source to target domain and find uh, final partition of the data. Unfortunately, time and memory complexity of, of quadratic order because we need to consider all pairs of elements, but it can be improved because we can use some methods such as stochastic gradient, and uh, using this method, it's possible 
to consider only part of data, uh, not all data pairs, uh, pairs of data points by some subsamples, and uh, this can reduce memory. Uh, we have performed experiments with some data sets, with artificial data sets using Monte Carlo uh, simulation with data. So we uh, generate data multiple times, then perform clustering and define the quality of the result. And then we can average the results of all uh, experiments. Uh, here are shown some example. Uh, examples of generated data use k-means as a basic algorithm and random forest and support vector machine for uh, classification and knowledge transfer. The next, the next example is more uh, of more real, real based, but it's, I think it's more, also some illustration of the method. So we used a MNIST data set of handwritten digits and perform uh, classification using fit forward artificial network. Uh, so we use batch, uh, some batch normalization, Sahasi gradient descent. And uh, in addition to the above mentioned, Meta features use also additional meta features, uh, such as normalized pairwise pair distances between objects and average distances to close the centroids. To uh, evaluate the quality of clustering, we applied uh, in external uh, cluster validity index. There are different types of external indices. For example, adjust rent, adjusted rent index. Uh, it estimates the degree of similarity between two partitions. The first one is obtained, and the second is a, the ground truth partition. And this index is a corrected for chance estimate of probability of covert assignments of object pairs to same or different clusters. Uh, the formula is given here. Uh, the more closer to one, the beta is the matching between the two partitions and index lowest to zero indicates nearly random correspondence. And this is the results of experiments, first of all, for artificial data. It can be seen that the proposed algorithm uh, gives some improvement of quality, clustering quality. And this is the example of decision boundary obtained uh, with support vector machine algorithm. So it can be seen that uh, silhouette based index is also give some information on the decision boundary. boundary. Uh, both of the features are useful for classification, but of course, causation, causation matrix base is more important. <coughs> And these are the examples, uh, results of experiments for real data on this database. So it can be seen that this algorithm also gives some improvement, not ideal, of course, but some improvement of clustering quality, the average best result and worst result. And here is given uh, an example of clusters obtained. You can see that the first cluster uh, includes uh, correct assignments and there are some mistakes in the second cluster. And this is a conclusion. So we propose uh, some uh, modification of ensemble clustering based on transfer learning. And of course, we, this is not ideal algorithm and uh, some future works are planned. Uh, for example, we are going 
to re, I mean me and my students from North Big State University, other types of metaphysics, metaphysics and application of the method in different fields, for example, for text document analysis. So this is all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for an interesting talk. Any questions from the audience? Well, if I may allow, I myself have uh, uh, one question. So, um, uh, to the best of my understanding, and please give me the rope here, so maybe I didn't understand correctly. So, uh, your work adds another layer on top of uh, classification, clusterization to uh, solve this problem. So, you're kind of doing it on the meta level. So, my question is actually about the interpretation, explainability of the features, because when you're adding more and more, uh, even if your underlying classifier is kind of, you know, inter interpretable, like let's say linear classifier, you can like interpret this, like uh, is uh, like is this uh, interpretability passed through your algorithm? What, what do you think uh, could, could uh, some approaches uh, in this direction uh, uh, help uh, the ones who want to do it? Yes, I think it's possible to evaluate the importance of the features using some methods such as random forest or so on. Yes, I think it's possible, if I correctly understood you. Ah, okay, so you are proposing uh, to uh, make an priority on the produced features, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, uh, okay, maybe the second question from myself uh, is related to the um, mm, uh, amount of hyperparameters you have because you haven't like, let's say, fr from my understanding is kind of really complicated data uh, analysis and feature engineering on top of it. Uh, so uh, I'm interested in like, let's say, how many hyperparameters uh, does uh, your, let's say, um, like say meta layer uh, adds to the like simpler parts. Yeah. If my question is, uh, <laughs> if I correctly understood, yeah, there are, uh, I think about a dozen of um, hyperparameters or meta features used in, in different literature or work, but we tried some to use some some of them, but. Uh, uh, the effect was pretty small. Uh, okay, uh, and uh, I assume there are also no online question because there are actually <laughs> selected people <laughs> are doing for the Zoom, but there may be some from the YouTube <laughs> translation. So thanks. Let's thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. And now uh, our next talk uh, should be an online talk. Uh, it's the work is named Metamorphic Testing for Recommender System by Sofia Yakusheva and uh, Anton uh, Hritankov. Yep, sorry if, if I misspelled something of that. Uh, let, let us just uh, switch to the Zoom translation now. Uh, so, hello everyone. I'm very happy to see all of you today. I'm very happy that I can present our work to you today. So, my name is Sofia Yakushova. I am uh, assistant at the Department of Algorithms and Programming Technologies at Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology. And Anton Hritankov is my supervisor. So, today we will talk about metamorphic testing for recommended systems. So, uh, recommender systems is a popular topic today, uh, but the problem is that they can badly hurt users if we don't test them uh, carefully. So, we should test them as carefully as we can. But we face a lot of problems, for example, lack of test data or needs for human judgment. Uh, all of these problems have a very high cost, so we can't use humans a lot. Uh, another problem is the stochastic nature of recommender systems uh, because not all the methods uh, can be applied to these systems. And the last but not the least, uh, the historical problem. 
So what is the historical problem? Uh, as I said, uh, the historical is a partial function. Uh, in simple words, this function say us if the test is passed or not. Uh, the uh, simplest example is if we have, for example, right answer for the test, we can just compare the answer of the program and the right answer and uh, say if the test is passed or not. Uh, but the historical problem says that uh, sometimes it's computationally expensive or even impossible to get a test oracle for some problems. And uh, testing recommender systems is such a problem uh, that uh, in general don't have test oracle. Uh, but fortunately, there are some met, uh, testings to test such problem. And one of them is metamorphic testing. Uh, the key idea of this method is not to check every single output. Uh, uh, and um, uh, instead of that, we uh, have many inputs of the program and many corresponding outputs. Our task is to check if there is a, some relation between these inputs and outputs. Uh, the smallest example is, for example, if we have a database and we request this database, uh, for the first request we use the filter A and the second we use filter A and B. So the answer for the second request will be a subset of the answer for the first request. And uh, we don't check if the first or second answer is correct uh, themselves. We just check the relation between them. So uh, we tried to apply this method for testing stochastic systems. Uh, I should say that uh, some articles on metamorphic testing use statistic methods, but uh, they use only criteria and do not pay much attention to the general overview of uh, the stochastic testing. So we make some generalization and propose stochastic metamorphic relation. So what is that? Uh, classic metamorphic relation is just a deterministic function uh, with many inputs uh, to the set of 0 and 1. So we consider this function as a composition of sampling procedure and uh, the function of determination. So the sampling procedure is stochastic and function of determination is something like uh, uh, statistic criteria, maybe. Uh, and uh, in this case, we will have much more information about our system than if we uh, use only classic metamorphic relation. Uh, we formulate some requirements for recommender systems in general. Uh, you can see all these requirements. It's technical reproducibility, ability to learn, uh, response to changes, comparison on different models, uh, homogeneity of parameters, some asymptotics, individual features of algorithms, and the response to linear transformations of distribution parameters. Uh, you can see somewhere uh, the word bandit. It's because we apply our method to the multi armed bandit problem. Now, multi armed bandit is a model of slot machine with several arms. If the user select some arms, uh, he can gain a reward. And the task of the user is to maximize this reward. And uh, this model used in some services like Amazon or Spotify, uh, when we have a list of options and we want to, uh, to get it for user. Uh, but we can uh, get only a short sublist of this list. So uh, we propose some metamorphic relations for multi armed bandit problem. We propose six, uh, but I want to show you only two of them. The other four can be easily derived for the, from the requirements, but these two are more interesting, I think. Uh, so uh, the requirement for the first was assumption about homogeneity of parameters. Uh, that means that if we permute bandit arms, 
uh, the reward should remain the same. Uh, so that means that the algorithm do not pay much more attention to the number of the arm. And uh, I think that's a very important property of the algorithm. Uh, and the second is comparison of less and more profitable uh, bandits. So if we apply some linear transformation to the probabilities of getting reward, uh, our reward will change correspondingly. So it will be uh, it will be bigger. Uh, but for optimal algorithm, uh, this reward uh, can be uh, get with linear transformations that we apply to our probabilities. Uh, I hope I uh, explained this <laughs> okay. Uh, so we test a lot of algorithms uh, of bandit. Some of them were stationary, some of them were non-stationary. For example, FD's WTS is non-stationary. And uh, for comparison, we uh, use a uh, random algorithm and optimal algorithm. And we use a multi-armed bandit model with Bernoulli distributions on each arms. And uh, these distributions were uh, stationary in time. So uh, we have some interesting results. Uh, for example, we compare different parameters for uh, X3 algorithm. And we notice that for some of these parameters, these algorithms work a lot worse than for others. So our uh, stochastic metamorphic relations are useful for detect bad algorithm parameters. Uh, for FD3TC, we notice that uh, permutation of arms have a lot of impact and uh, it is not very well. Uh, there are some examples of failures that we detected. Uh, this picture shows failure in uh, configuration. So uh, our, uh, our metamorphic relation was applied only for the first algorithm in the bench of algorithms and uh, the other were the same so it was our mistake and we uh, fortunately correct this uh other example uh, is uh, for configuration fails too uh in our project the configuration files were a bit complicated so uh, this picture shows uh, almost identical uh, experiments that were uh, supposed to be uh, completely different and uh, it is uh, another example uh, and the most interesting result uh, we uh, apply uh, the six hour uh, hour smear uh, for algorithm and uh, this smr was about linear transformation of probabilities so we expect uh, that uh, if we uh, apply this linear transformation for the first experiment, we will get the same reward as for the second experiment where the probabilities were transformed already. But we uh, don't have such a result. Uh, these values were different. Uh, for random algorithms, these values were the same. But for the others, this was completely different. And you can see at the picture for the purple line that uh, the algorithms don't even multiply it reward like the others. This was FD's WTS algorithm, uh, which is not stationary. And uh, there we use our stochastic part of metamorphic relations uh, to uh, analyze the error. So you can see that for the random algorithm, this uh, difference uh, was almost zero. And for X3, uh, it is not that big, but still not zero. Uh, for Thompson sampling algorithms, this difference 
um, is less during the time. And for the expiry, it's rising, I think. And for if this WTS algorithm, this difference is significantly uh, bigger than zero and uh, much more bigger uh, than for the other algorithms. So we consider this result as an individual feature for F this WTS algorithm, because the uh, model uh, which is used in this algorithm is uh, more complex than for us. So in conclusion, we uh, consider the problem of recommended system verification. We propose some stochastic metamorphic relations, formulate requirements for recommender systems in general, derive stochastic metamorphic relations for multi band problem, test the problem, and find some failures. So a code of our experiments is accepted, acceptable in the internet. You can see it via links on the screen. And a small addition from the experiments that we uh, don't include to our paper, uh, we uh, test some um, bandits, contextual bandits, uh, which uh, use uh, additional information of context. For example, the season or the time of day or the uh, number of days in the week. And we uh, consider two algorithms, C2 UCB and Lin UCB. We test them on the uh, constant context, and we uh, discover then Lin UCB algorithm uh, learn very well, and C2 UCB doesn't learn at all. And we make a conclusion that C2 UCB algorithm is much more focused on the context than the Lin UCB algorithm. Uh, so our uh, stochastic metamorphic relations are useful for uh, discovering such thing. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Uh, my uh, talk is over. I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, dear Sofia, uh, thanks for your interesting talk and another additional thanks from, from me, the chair. So you just made it in 12 minutes. So we will be just on time, unlike the German trains. So do we have any questions from the audience? I have uh, a question uh, about uh, this approach. Um, I'm actually interested is in some, uh, so to the best of my understanding, you propose uh, another way uh, of doing, let's say, A-B testing in a way. So, um, and you propose, yes, uh, uh, another approach to the multi-term uh, bandits problem. Uh, I am curious uh, whether you uh, thought about of the combined strategy uh, of like uh, combining your algorithm with the other known algorithms in the field, such as Epsilon Greedy or Thompson sampling, uh, whether it could yield better results, uh, whether uh, the combination of the algorithms work, for example, like switching from one mode of decision making uh, on the test to another. Thanks. Um. Uh, so, uh, metamorphic testing is more about offline testing of the algorithm. Oh, when we test just models or our realization, it's more about uh, of verification of requirements and not the A-B testing. But the uh, uh, idea of this uh, SMRs is quite the same because we use some statistics. Uh, for future um, of our work, we uh, will try to uh, to make some um, compositions of these metamorphic relations uh, for complex system. So we can propose some relation for the company to the system, but the, for the whole system, it's a much more complex, hard, complicated. I don't know. 
Uh, so this is a uh, um, vector for our future work. But about a B testing, so maybe it's uh, a good idea. But unfortunately, for A B testing, we should use uh, users or bots. And it, this is quite expensive. For our small research, we just make some experiments and, <laughs> and have a result. But your, inter your idea is very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have a question from the audience. Um, thank you for the talk. Uh, am I right that you tested everything on uh, Bernoulli rewards? The model? Uh, at uh, this stage, yes. Just uh, bend it with uh, stationary Bernoulli reward. Uh, uh, this reward is uh, zero or one at yes, yes. Uh, I, every I, I, step. I, yes, I see. Uh, the question is, uh, do you plan to like extend it to different models of reward, like distributions? No, and, of course. Of course, yeah. we okay. plan this. Good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Um, yeah, well, uh, it seems like we're out of question now, but we still have some additional time. So let's thank the speaker again. And thank you very much for your thank attention. You. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, our next speaker should, our next talk uh, is titled Application of Multimodal Machine Learning for Image Recommendation Systems by Mikhail Fanyakov, Anatoly Bardukov, and Delia Makarov. Uh, good morning. My name is Mikhail Fenikov, and I'm graduate of High School of Economics of the program Master of Data Science. My supervisor is Anatoly Berdukov. The topic of my paper is application of multimodal machine learning for image recommendation system. Uh, we are living in the era of an abundance of information. It can be very difficult to find the necessary information or some important content. People use online stores, e-commerce platforms, marketplace, but they need to systemize all this information. People start to upload the information, upload the information, images for everything they, they preferred. It can be product, a landscape, some funny photo. So images became the basis of the development of recommendations and main data types, and one of the main data types of recommender system. What is the recommender system? It's a class of machine learning algorithm that use data to help predict and find what people are looking for among an exponentially growing number of options. This system have one basic goal to solve the problem of information overload, making it easier for the users to search the goods. However, these traditional recommendation algorithm are not perfect. There are many types of data that can be used for recommendation purpose. Additional purpose of the goods, descriptive text of the goods, or some metrics which we can obtain. These properties or characteristics are called multimodal information. And the system that use the information are called multimodal. What's multimodal? Multimodal, the application, the application of multiple approach within one medium. What's multimodal data? Multimodal data is data with different types, such as different embeddings, text descriptions, various types of metrics. It allows us to implement different features, which simplify the training process and obtaining high quality recommendation. Uh, for building my recommenders system, we need a sum data set for learning our model. I use data set with images from Yandex and it has the following structure. Initial image. Initial image, it, is, it can be a completely random image. Candidate image, the picture which is recommended or isn't recommended for the initial image. And of course, the target. Is the pair ta target, binomial target, uh, of the pair of the images. One, the image are similar, and zero, the image are not similar. So more than uh, 75,000 pairs have target one, and about uh, 
30,000 has a target zero. Thus, the data has is imbalanced, has imbalanced structure and needs some preprocessing. What pre for building multimodal system, we should use different features for each images. An important part of our recommended system is a description text of the picture. I have passed it from Yandex picture using the beautiful SubPython library. This is the simplest and the most accessible method. I obtain the text in different language for each picture. I processed all images using clip. It's a very useful technique for image embeddings with a lot of models. For text processing, I used another technique, which is called BERT. I used some multimodal, uh, multilingual model in 104 languages. The next step is of preprocessing data is matrix counting. For each pair of images and text, I use two metrics to count pair distances between two clips, between two clips vectors for images and two bad vectors for text. Cosine similarity and the uh, square Euclidean. Uh, I chose from four models. It's decision tree classifier, a random forest classifier, XG boost classifier, we, and card boost classifier with queries and without queries. Queries is groups for candidate images. It is equal to number of initial images. We see that the card boost classifier has the best results. So our data set has the following structure. It's 10 features, two embedding features of clip dimensions, two embedding features for bare dimensions, four numerical features for metrics, one feature is the binomial target variable, and one feature is a query, categorical feature, the number of the related image. Uh, here we see that the optimal learning rate is 0, 0, 0, 0.001. Uh, for my multimodal recommender system, I will the model based on cut boost algorithm. It is an algorithm for gradient boosting on decision tree, which was developed by, by Yandex engineer. In this algorithm, I will I use cut boost classifier package, the classificator, classificator of the cut boost algorithm, because my data set has only two target variables, zero and one. For model constructing, my data needs in some preprocessing. Matrix feature was scaled using standard scale method. I learned my model with following hyperparameters. Iterations is at uh, 2,000. It is optimal number of iteration for learning model with such data. L stop rounds is 20. The algorithm stops in training if the parameter dictate. Learning rate is 0 0.001. I need a small gradient step size. It helps to learn my model more accurately. Max depth is six. It is the optimal depth of the trees for classification model and scale post white 2.64. As I have imbalanced data, I use the parameter with this value, which is equal to ratio of majority class to minority class. Model result. As a loss, as a loss function, I use algorithmic loss function. This is matrix of evaluating the performance by binary classification model. Uh, as a custom metric, I used AUG area under curve. AUG is an effective method to visualize the performance of the model. After the learning model, we have the AUG is equal to 0 0.83. It says the probability of prediction positive class is higher than the prediction of negative class. The loss, a function log loss of the model is 0 0.29. However, I will use predicted probabilities of positive classes output of our model. It will help us to range the result of our future experiments. Experiment. Profound metrics shows, profound shows so the, qu the quality of ranging as we will range our images. It's indicated is 0 0.77. So we need uh, some exper experiments for with our data. Uh, for the experiment, the data need, needs in another preprocessing. What the data preprocess what the data preprocessing is. Uh, we set three experiments. 
uh, using only clip embeddings, using only BERT embeddings, and using our model with clip and BERT embeddings. For experiments, my data set needs some preparation. I divided it using package commins from the Escalon lab library. This is the most popular clusterization method. I separated my data set into 1,000 clusters according to clip and BERT vector. Also, I have obtained the cluster distance for each cluster of each image. Then, using this data, I counted three nearest clusters for each images, and I have separated my data set into pairs according to belonging in three clusters. For each pair, I counted its cosine similarity and Euclidean distance for clip and BERT vectors. So, I have data set with the following structure. The clip vector for related image, the clip vector for candidate image, the BERT vector for related image, the BERT vector for candidate image, the cosine similarity between two clip vectors, the cosine similarity between two BERT vectors, the Euclidean distance between clip vectors and the Euclidean distance to BERT vectors. So, my experiments, we group a certain number of candidates with the higher, with the higher focus signs, with the higher focus sign similarity and with the lower for Euclidean distance matrix of clip vectors, BERT vectors or probabilities of the positive class for each image. In this case, the number is equal to five. For gas cast boot model and clip vector, the system selected the correct images without any mistakes. Uh, so the accuracy here is equal to one. For the BERT embedding, the system has two mistakes in the first and the second images. Uh, and the, for BERT vector, the, 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 the image, uh, like, for the correct images for the BERT vector, the system made two mistakes in the first and the second images. Its accuracy is 0 0.4. Uh, the second experiment, CADBOOST model has mistakes in the last image. The accuracy is 0 0.8. CLIP model has mistakes in the fourth and the fifth image. The accuracy is 0 0.6. BERT model has no correct images, of course. And the accuracy is zero. Uh, the experiment number three, CADBOOST model, CLIP model, and BERT model has no mistakes, so the accuracy is one. Uh, the experiment number four, CADBOOST models has no mistakes. The accuracy is one, CLIP model has mistake in the second image. Uh, the accuracy is 0 0.8. BERT model has, the, has mistakes in the third, fourth, and fifth image. The accuracy is 0 0.8. 0 0.4. Uh, experiment number five, for the CADBOOST model and clip vector, the system selected the correct images without any mistakes. So the accuracy here is equal to one. For the BERT embedding, the system has mistakes in the third image. Its accuracy is 0 0.8. So, so I also analyzed 2025 images and obtain the following result. For card boost model, the average accuracy is more than 0 0.8. Uh, the accuracy of clip vector is less than 0 0.8 and the accuracy of bad vector is less than 0 0.5. Also, I, I have experiment for Flickr image data set. The Flickr image data set is See, it's simpler than the Yandex data set. So in the experiment one, the all models have accuracy uh, equal to one, the second equal to one, two, and the third, and the third experiment, third experiment, uh, there are no mistakes of the card boost model for clip vector. There is one mistake in the fourth image. So the accuracy is 0 0.8 for BERT embedding the system has mistake in the third, fourth, and fifth image. The accuracy is 0 0.4. I have analyzed 50 image and get the following result. For card boost model, the accurate average accuracy is more than 0 0.97. For the clip vector, 0 0.95. And for the BERT, BERT vectors is less than 0 0.85. 
So this is a unique multimodal recommender system for images. Model is based not only image features, but also text features such as embedding and metrics. However, the ad additional training for BAT model and built more uh, additional training for BAT and built more perfect vectors. Looking for another NLP model is getting additional text for pictures and finding additional features. So the multimodal needs to improve constantly. Perfect, there will be more researches for the topics and the system has a wonderful future. Thank you for attention. Uh, Mikhail, thank you for your talk. Extra points for making it short and precise. We have quite a few questions on the audience. Yes, uh, let's start with you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I just want to clarify, you mentioned that uh, the for the CutBoost algorithm, your depth was six, and you mentioned that uh, it was optimal one. Uh, can you please explain how, how did you determine that it was the optimal one? Did you did perform some grid search or did you fix the over parameters and just run through the depth only or something else? Thank you. Uh, I, would you. Would you like to uh, please repeat your question? Yes, I, in simple words, why why did you choose your depth to be six in CutBoost model? Uh, that, that the depth to be six is the optimal depth of the many decision trees algorithm. It's not it's optimal depth uh, it's not um it's not neat the depth are uh, more than six and the less depth is not perfect yep thank you another question uh thank you michael thank you for the talk if you can open the slides the the examples were one moment very interesting uh it seems that yeah it seems that you find, uh, using the query, you find similar images. One, right? one moment, one moment. Yeah, with pictures. So you consider this as the uh, criteria for uh, quality. The accuracy here is the, the similar image is the better, right? Yes, yes, of course. The similar image, uh, the first okay. column is the related image. Yes, and the five. Question is, okay, I have two questions. Why yeah. is that uh, actually a recommender system? Uh, for me, it look, looks like a, like a similarity search, looking for similar images or something like this. Uh, can you comment on this? And the second question, uh, you know, if you, in practice, if you recommend to users uh, all the images that are similar that they like uh, the your system will get uh, positive feedback and will degrade uh, the quality i mean if you show uh, nice cats to a user and user likes it next time you show more nice cats and after several iterations uh, user will get only the nice cats pictures in his uh, you know recommender uh, system uh, how how your uh, approach will solve such uh, problem? Uh, yeah, and the first one is just uh, why you do, why you call it the recommender system if it is uh, just a similarity uh, search? Why why I as I say that my uh, this recommender system is based on clip and BERT, BERT embeddings. Uh, so the recommender system is uh, using these fe these features, of course and recommend system according to main two parts, clip, clip embeddings and BERT embeddings. So the future work of, of this recommended system is to learn the BERT model, to learn the BERT model. For the result, the result uh, show, show that the BERT model have the uh, less, uh, less accuracy, the smaller accuracy than the clip and the cut boost model. Okay. And the BERT, the, the BERT model will be more advanced uh, for learning the BERT model is the best way to improve this recommended system, of course. Okay. Um, 
I didn't get if I if it is the answer, but <laughs> okay. But what about the degradation of uh, the model? If you, in practice, if you recommend the same images to the user all the time, degradation. Uh, yeah, degradation. As I said, the model has a good future. The who the wonderful has a wonderful future. Wonderful it, future. Okay. Wonderful <laughs> future. When the when the model will. Uh, learn will be learn will be learn regularly with uh -huh. BERT BERT model, and in the advance in the future, uh, it can be it can be better to use ChatGPT model instead BERT, or the more more complex model than BERT, of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, maybe other question. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, maybe I would just also would like to note on on this very work. So it's kind of uh, this uh, multimodal approach is a kind of a new territory. And one of the reviewers also had this question: Why is the recommender system if if it's like you know just the similarity system? Um, and it's really again hard uh, to account for all the uh, for the problems and practical applications of the newer approach. But I think we could all agree so the multimodal approaches, uh, like you know, they in this work they yield better results uh, and uh, like should be considered when building uh, this approach building as a part of the recommender system. Yes, I guess we have no questions from the audience so let's thank the speaker again um yeah so uh dear uh dear uh, online participants uh, unfortunately one of our speakers is uh, unable to deliver uh, the yes uh, yes mikhail <laughs> yes <laughs> yes <free. laughs> yeah unfortunately uh, our speaker right now is unable uh, to deliver uh, the uh, the report in English. We will in the dark and weird times. Uh, and unfortunately, we also have some responsibilities as international uh, conference. So uh, like in terms of the international, uh, the next report uh, will be uh, of the record, uh, but we will uh, give a chance to dis disseminate the knowledge between acknowledged speakers. So once again, unfortunately, next uh, report will be on Russian only. Uh, so uh, yes, uh, uh, we would like to thank our international guests. So на следующий доклад будет по русски. Извинения всем международным коллегам, которые не понимают русский язык. И доклад называется Application of Dynamic Graph CNN and FICP for Detection and Research Archaeology Sites. И Александр будет сейчас нам докладывать. Спасибо. Здравствуйте еще раз, коллеги. Приношу извинения за такую вот ситуацию, в которую я попал от себя лично и вот от всего нашего научного коллектива. Я представляю доклад «Применение динамического графа сверточной нейронной сети» и комбинированного итеративного алгоритма ближайших точек для вот таких прикладных задач, как детекция и исследование археологических памятников. Надо сказать, что результаты, которые мы получили, они связаны с выполнением нашим коллективом гранта Российского научного фонда, который мы получили в этом году. Вот в результате выполнения этого проекта мы должны решить две научные задачи. Во-первых, создать методы для детекции археологических памятников. И вторая группа методов – это для исследования археологических памятников. Если говорить про самому математическую основу этих методов, то они основаны на методах машинного обучения, методах геофизики и картографирования. Надо сказать, что достаточно недавно археологи практически занимались детекцией археологических памятников вручную. Ну, например, они использовали для решения данной задачи данные аэрофото, аэрофотоснимков и космоснимков. Вот в левой части слайда мы можем видеть как раз-таки аэрофотоснимок, ну а в правой части результаты его дешифрирования. 
Ну вот в последние, наверное, 15 лет методы точных наук получили достаточно широкое распространение в археологии, ну и в том числе методы геофизики и машинного обучения. Достаточно много работ в этом направлении ведется. Вот я, пожалуй, остановлюсь только на одной работе, которая была проведена коллективом немецких археологов. Они как раз-таки исследовали поселения Средневековья. Но эти поселения себя представляли на сегодняшний день некоторые курганы и занимались детекцией вот этих поселений по данным датчиков глубины, которые они получали с камер глубины и во время пролетных камер, которые были установлены на беспилотных летательных операторах. Ну, вот здесь можно видеть некоторую визуализацию, визуализацию, как выглядят данные курганы. Нас эта работа заинтересовала по той простой причине, что археологические памятники, которые находятся на территории Южного Урала, и вот, вот эти курганы, которые находятся на территории Германии, они имеют схожие признаки дешифрирования. Ну, вот немножко расскажу о том, что из себя представляют памятники, археологические памятники на территории Южного Орала. Большинство из них относятся к так называемому бронзовому веку и связаны с миграциями индоевропейцев на территорию Урала и Юго-Западной Сибири. Там они организовали целый пласт городов, многие из которых находятся в рамках так называемой Синтакштинской культуры по названию реки Синташта. Но самым известным памятником этого комплекса является город Аркаим. Ну, а на самом деле на сегодняшний день выделено порядка 20 подобных укрепленных городищ помимо Аркаима. В 80-х годах прошлого века профессором Зановичем был опубликован такой фундаментальный труд – в котором он исследовал вот все вот эти города, ну и фактически там же были определены признаки дешифрирования этих археологических памятников, которые мы использовали в нашем проекте. Нами было выделено 9 классов интереса, 5 из которых обозначены как К1, К5, это классы курганов, которые имеют различные текстуры, то есть это какая-то распаханная поверхность, либо какая-то каменистая поверхность, Два объекта – это могильники. Одни из них относят к эпохе вот как раз и бронзового века, а другие могильники связаны с более поздним освоением этих территорий, ну, в частности, с бронзовым веком. И также поселения – укрепленные и неукрепленные, соответственно, классы P1 и P2. Ну вот на данном слайде представлены некоторые признаки дешифрирования. На самом деле их достаточно много. И многие из них, в принципе, конечно, не удастся использоваться в методах машинного обучения, такие как, допустим, размер объекта, либо там взаимное расположение объектов относительно друг друга. Но, тем не менее, вот такие признаки существуют. Если немецкие археологи в своей работе использовали, собственно говоря, только один источник данных, то мы в своей работе опираемся на шесть источников информации. Первый источник – это, собственно говоря, Материалы аэрофотосъемки, которые были произведены еще в прошлом веке, когда не было хозяйственного освоения данных территорий, и они имеют очень большое значение, поскольку на них многие эти археологические памятники еще видны. После того, как там была распахана пашня, конечно же, исследовать эти объекты становится значительно сложнее. Второй источник – это данные дистанционного зондирования Земли, мы используем такие данные со спутников Sentinel, Landcast, ResourceP и Canopus B. Надо сказать, что у нас собралась достаточно большая коллекция таких снимков за достаточно продолжительный период. Это несколько сотен снимок. И что очень важно, что эти снимки с высоким пространственным разрешением, то есть до 0,7 метров на 1 пиксель. Нами были проведены также некоторые исследования с помощью тахиметрических датчиков, ну, в частности, датчиков Trimble, датчика Trimble. И было построено порядка 40 моделей 
которые описывают в виде облака точек вот эти поселения бронзового века на территории Южного Урала. Существовали и другие ортофотопланы, которые археологи получали с 2006 года по этим участкам, но они также были использованы в проекте. Кроме того, достаточно интересный источник, с которым вот мы начали работать только в этом году. И здесь коллеги из ОРОРАН Института теофизики пришли нам на помощь и выполнили с помощью прибора АМК-14 магнитометрическую съемку трех поселений – Степное, Верхнеуральское и Левобережное. Ну а также мы используем данные глубины. Вот в этом году на двух поселениях мы засняли с помощью беспилотника и камеры глубины эти поселения и получили их подробные трехмерные карты. Все источники данных можно поделить принципиально на два типа. Это двумерные данные и трехмерные данные. Для обработки двухмерных данных мы используем остаточные нейронные сети, то есть сети Резнет. В общем-то, идем по пути немецких коллег. А вот для анализа трехмерных данных нами был предложен и опубликован, в том числе, в результатах этого доклада новый метод. Мы его называем методом DGCNN со звездочкой, либо у него есть еще второе название, которое ему дали MGCNN, так называемый мультимодальный граф сверточной нейронной сети. Надо сказать, что методы для классификации и сегментации трехмерных моделей данных бывают разные. Условно их можно поделить на две большие группы. Это прямые и непрямые методы. Но в первую очередь интересуют, конечно, прямые методы, яркими представителями которых являются методы DGCNN и FGCNN. Но для решения поставленной нашей задачи данные методы не совсем хорошо подходят. И это связано с их недостатками. Вот первый из таких недостатков – это ограничение по размерности данных. Эти методы хорошо работают в промышленном дизайне, когда размерность задачи – это несколько тысяч точек, ну, где-то до 10 точ, тысяч точек. Если точек уже становится больше, а у нас вот порядок это бывает 13 тысяч, 22 тысячи в облаке, то эти методы уже не очень хорошо работают. Вторая проблема связана с тем, какую форму имеют трехмерные модели. Вот эти методы хорошо работают для выпуклых моделей данных. Археологические памятники бронзового века, они расположены в степи в лес, или в какой-то даже запустыненной территории, поэтому вот визуально эти городища представляют из себя достаточно выпуклые объекты. Есть также проблемы, связанные с тем, что вот эти методы в основном используют одну либо две модальности, но информацию о свете они, как правило, вообще не используют. Ну и вот для преодоления этих недостатков нам была предложена новая архитектура, которую мы назвали динамически взвешенный мультимодальный сверточный граф нейронной сети. Он имеет входные данные, которые содержат 12 признаков. Это, собственно говоря, сами координаты точек, это нормали точкам, это цветовые признаки, и также впоследствии этот набор добавляется еще нормализованными координатами, поэтому на каждую точку приходится 12 признаков. Но также добавлю, поскольку RGB это все-таки не независимые признаки, то мы в нашей работе осуществляем преобразование RGB в HSV, ну и таким образом нам тоже удается повысить качество решения задачи сегментации. Вот Суть нашей концепции заключается в том, что мы представляем, собственно говоря, наше облако точек в виде взвешенного динамического графа, который описывается с помощью матрицы Киргофа. При этом построение вот этой матрицы Киргофа происходит в каждом сверточном слое нашей нейронной сети. Ну и вот в области... Вот таких графах, динамических пространственных графах, вот эти сверточные слои принято называть слоями H-Convolution. Помимо всего этого, вот в эту архитектуру был добавлен у нас свой метрический классификатор, который основан на двух многослойных нейронных сетях и одном классификаторе с радиально-базисными функциями. С радиально-базисными функциями. 
Вот на данном слайде представлен алгоритм, который иллюстрирует основные шаги работы этого алгоритма. Добавлю, что, конечно, существует точное решение задачи спектральной фильтрации, но нам еще важно, чтобы была достаточно высокая производительность. Поэтому мы используем полиномы Чебышева третьего порядка с коэффициентами 6, 5 и 3 для аппроксимации спектральной фильтрации. Ну и вот основной цикл обработки, он в нашем графе сверточной нейронной сети состоит в следующих этапах. Это построение матрицы Тергофа, нормализация компонента этой матрицы, аппроксимация сигнала графа с помощью полинома Чебышева, ну, в данном случае третьего порядка, выполнение, собственно говоря, операции свертки на графе, ну и формирование выхода. Ну, далее здесь есть некоторые нюансы с конкатенацией локальных и глобальных признаков, ну и вот генерируется итоговый выход тоже в виде радиальных базисных функций. Также на что следует обратить внимание. Вот здесь в архитектуру был добавлен еще один слой предварительной обработки, который делает повышающую дискретизацию облака точек. Но для чего это, собственно говоря, делается? Потому что, как правило, сканеры глубины, они дают данные достаточно зашумленные, неравномерные, что самым негативным образом сказывается на качестве сегментации. И вот мы с помощью метода КНН добавляем по три точки в каждой точке, в результате вот получаем плотное такое однородное равномерное облако точек. Ну и здесь тоже можно увидеть, что у нас есть у нашей сверточной нейронной сети два выхода. Первый выход, он решает у нас задачу классификации объектов, ну то есть глобально в смысле, то есть кто из, какой из объектов изображен на картинке. Ну а второй выход сверточной нейронной сети связан с решением задачи сегментации данных. Теперь немножко поговорим о том, какая используется функция потерь в нашем графике. Но по большому счету эта функция представляет из себя мультиклассовую кросс-энтропию, но в нее вот добавлен еще второй такой вспомогательный параметр, который связан с гладкостью сигнала в графике. И этот параметр позволяет нам делать, собственно говоря, объекты смежных точек, в облаке более похожим. Еще остановимся на одном моменте. То есть вот эти облака точек, трехмерные данные, они могут быть получены тоже разными способами. То есть мы можем взять тахиометрический датчик, но поскольку это достаточно ровная поверхность, мы можем получить сразу всю модель нашего археологического памятника за одну съемку. Если же мы уже будем использовать какой-то лидар, установленный на беспилотнике, то у нас так уже не получится. И для того, чтобы снять археологический памятник, нам потребуется несколько снимков или точек. То же самое можно сказать, когда поверхность какая-то неровная, да, то есть холмистая. И вот в этих случаях, для того, чтобы сопоставить данные с разных ракурсов, в компьютерном зрении решается вот такая задача, как регистрация данных. Нами достаточно давно для решения другой задачи одновременной навигации и картографирования был предложен новый алгоритм. Мы его называем комбинированный итеративный алгоритм ближайших точек. И вот этот алгоритм был применен в том числе в рамках вот этого исследования, которое я вам сейчас рассказываю, для регистрации данных об археологических памятниках. Но остановлюсь только на основных двух свойствах этого алгоритма. Этот алгоритм использует, помимо облаков точек, данные об особых точек для решения двух проблем вот этого итеративного алгоритма ближайших точек. Первая из проблем связана с выбором начального значения матрицы поворота и вектора переноса. Ну, вот как раз-таки мы решаем в начале регистрации относительно визуальных данных, подбираем какие-то параметры, ну и таким образом нам удается получить вот эти начальные значения. И это уже становится намного лучше, нежели чем подбирать эти значения R и T каким-то эмпирическим путем. Ну и второе, как вы видите, из вида функционала, этот функционал содержит два слагаемых, то есть мы, по сути дела, выполняем совместное решение задачи относительно визуальных признаков и трехмерных данных. В работе были проведены 
некоторые эксперименты, эксперименты в так называемых контролируемых условиях и в неконтролируемых условиях. Под неконтролируемыми условиями мы понимаем различные шумы, шумы матричных приемников, неравномерное освещение и так далее. Ну вот мы видим, что наш алгоритм, он здесь обозначен так, такой линией пунктирной, он имеет некоторые преимущества по сравнению с методами регистрации SCP, известными такими, как ICP с метрикой point-to-point, point-to-point с экстраполяцией и с метрикой point-to-plane, точка плоскости. Теперь давайте немного поговорим о компьютерном моделировании. Ну вот, если говорить про цифровые модели, ортофотопланы, которые получаются при съемке с беспилотника, то вот они выглядят каким-то таким образом. Как я уже говорил, перед нами в исследовании стоит принципиальные две задачи. Первая задача связана с детекцией археологического памятника с помощью остаточной нейронной сети. То есть нам важно, в принципе, определить место, что здесь может быть, в принципе, памятник, но не обязательно он может быть. Вот как раз-таки красным светом здесь э, нейронная сеть обнаружила потенци потенциальный археологический памятник. Ну, вот другой снимок. Здесь вы видите тоже два поселения, укрепленных выделено предположительно, и курганы. Но если говорить про курганы, конечно, здесь может быть много ошибок, ну, что покажут потом и результаты компьютерного моделирования. Вот после того, как э, такой объект был детектирован, э, мы можем выделить вот эту зону интереса. И вот в этой зоне интереса у нас находится предполагаемый объект. И уже, собственно говоря, для этой зоны интереса проводятся различные методы исследования, в том числе с привлечением методов геофизики. Вот а, этом... Александр, я не а? тебе, извиняюсь, мы немножко а? убиваемся из времени. Скажите, сколько вам еще нужно минут? Ну, давайте строить? я за пять минут тогда закончу, и все тогда. Ну, меньше, чем лучше. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. В этом году были проведены вот такие у нас полевые работы. Мы выезжали вот на новое городище Верхнеуральское. Ну, надо сказать, что вообще укрепленных поселений всего было открыто 22 до сегодняшнего года. И вот в этом году удалось открыть, вот в том числе с применением вот таких методов, два новых укрепленных поселения, вот которые мы сейчас взялись изучать. Одно из них – это поселение Верхнеуральское. Ну, вот здесь как раз-таки наложены данные глубины на этот снимок. Ну и вот, собственно говоря, цифровая трехмерная модель, снятая с датчика глубины, она выглядит вот таким образом. Вот мы видим здесь этот археологический памятник. Это вот соответствующие аэрофотоснимки этого памятника в разном качестве, вот получены еще вот в прошлых годах, в годах 50-х, 60-х годах прошлого века. Ну, а это результаты магнитометрической съемки. Мы также планируем, собственно говоря, использовать методы машинного обучения для того, чтобы работать вот с такими данными, но пока это ближайшая перспектива. Вот на данном снимке вы можете как раз-таки увидеть результаты детекции археологических памятников, то есть сопротивление магнитного поля в поверхностных слоях. Ну вот это немножко глубже уже, на несколько метров данные магнитометрии. Вот после того, как этот памятник был обнаружен, мы к нему также применяем известные методы, в том числе метод DGCNN, или как мы его называем, MGCNN, для сегментации его пространств. Нас прежде всего интересуют здесь уже классы двух типов. Это, собственно говоря, наличие некоторых рвов и жилищные камеры. Ну вот как раз-таки результаты сегментации этого памятника вот, представлены на данном слайде. Ну, здесь видно четко, что вот есть вот такой облако точек, и здесь градациями от желтого к красному обозначены рвы, ну а синим, зеленым – жилищные впадины. Ну и вот таким образом получается без, в общем-то, раскопок определить расположение вот таких археологических памятников и понять внутреннюю структуру. Вот такой, в общем-то, щадящий дистанционный метод исследования археологических памятников, в общем-то, позволит археологам изучить без раскопа структуру, собственно говоря, археологического памятника, понять, где у него находятся, собственно говоря, рвы, где у него находятся жилищные камеры и так далее. Нами в работе были проведены, естественно, некоторые эксперименты в плане сравнительного анализа. Мы сравнивали как прямые методы, 
так и непрямые. Но для непрямых методов мы взяли мультивидовый CNN, ну, использовали, а в качестве прямого метода взяли DGCNN и использовали некоторые комбинации DGCNN с детектором YOLO. То есть использовали два канала информации. Ну, вот в результате таких экспериментов нам удалось выяснить, что вот для некоторых классов курганов К1, К2 и К4 получаются достаточно впечатляющие результаты, причем предложенный вот нами метод, вот он здесь находится в нижней части, он обладает преимуществами. Но вот такие классы, которые как К3 и К5, вот эта так называемая дерновая распаханная поверхность или так называемые курганы, курганы с усами, они достаточно плохо детектируются как известными методами, так и нашим методом, так что есть еще большое пространство для каких-то работ. Ну и на следующем слайде есть результаты детектирования уже укрепленных и неукрепленных поселений и могильников. Ну и мы видим, что вот как раз-таки применение нашего метода для сегментации и классификации поселений дает достаточно хорошие результаты, но по могильникам пока такими результатами похвастаться мы не можем. Ну, на этом у меня все. Спасибо за внимание. Вот еще раз извините за эту проблему, которая возникла. Ну, Так-то я, в принципе, планировал приехать в Армению, уже билеты купил, но вот заболел. Ну, я дальше вот попал в такую нехорошую организацию, как инфекционное отделение госпиталей. Вот здесь сейчас я нахожусь. Вопросы? Давайте поблагодарим докладчика. Мы немножко, конечно, выбиваемся из времени, отнимаем время на обед у коллег, но если есть вопросы у кого-то из присутствующих в зале? Да, у меня один быстрый вопрос, я знаю, что все хотят держать. Мне очень интересно, спасибо за интересное исследование, мне интересны части данных, которые вы использовали со спутников. Насколько я себе представляю, большинство спутников, они делают съемку на различных длинах волны, и не только в видимом спектре, но еще и в других. Скажите, пожалуйста, это как-то используется ли в работах, Потому что, насколько я вас видел, у вас все в РГБ, то есть все из видимого спектра вычислялось. Да, я скажу сейчас, мы используем все каналы, в том числе как бы инфракрасные каналы. Мы не используем только какие спутниковые данные, то есть то, что снимается там, в ночное и вечернее время суток, и такие снимки бывают, но ну, часто это раз. И мы не берем, естественно, снимки, которые содержат облачность. Ну вот сколько мы не пытались, в общем-то, удалять эту облачность, ничего там хорошего не получалось, поэтому... Вот берем, собственно говоря, все доступные каналы, но вот исключаем из них вот снимки, которые содержат некоторые атмосферные явления, облачность, ну и если попадают, такое иногда бывает на какое-то вот неправильное время съемки. Понял, спасибо. Uh, спасибо докладчику. So, thank, uh, I would like to thank everyone. Ah, yes, let's thank the presenter again. Yeah. I would like uh, again to thank everyone for participating uh, in our section, both online and offline presenters. Uh, uh, thank you for your contribution. Uh, please have a nice rest of the conference. <laughs>
you are online. If you are able to introduce me in that manner, uh, this is my pleasure to restart it. Okay. Okay, dear colleagues. So we can start our uh, session about theoretical machine learning and optimization methods. And uh, we have uh, only three presentations this session, so we can be more free with our time limits. Uh, but I ask all the authors, all the speakers, to keep the regular time limit about 25 minutes, including the answers and questions. So um, our first speaker is my old friend and colleague, Dr. Dmitry Ignatov from um, <coughs> High School of Economics, University of Moscow. And uh, I thought uh, it is very, very interesting uh, theoretical talk about uh, um, mathematical logic, maybe formal concepts. So um, uh, you can see his title. So Professor Ignatov, the whole is yours, you're welcome, please. Uh, dear Mikhail, thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me start the talk. This talk will be about uh, partition lattices and a specific problem, uh, maximum anti-chains in partition lattices, their size and enumeration. Uh, not, uh, I, would, I can't say that uh, these results are, how to say, uh, breakthrough results, but at least they would add some some bricks uh, to the current state of the art on the problem. Uh, since our referees asked about applied introduction into the problem, I decided to include motivation from data mining perspective, and I omitted uh, some theoretical stuff. Um, here is the outline of my talk. After that, I'm going to go on to the motivation from combinatorics perspective on the problems which are announced. And then we'll go uh, through partition lattices as concept lattices. Then we'll consider the problem statement, actually three problems we are considering here. They are closely interrelated. And I will talk about our solutions of these problems, both the theoretical ones and the practical ones, meaning that we added some new numbers into online encyclopedia of integer sequences counting the respective patterns. So motivation from data mining perspective might be well familiar to you. If you go to the supermarket, you can buy some stuff there. And some of the items you can buy frequently, as, uh, as many other uh, customers on a daily basis. One of such uh, product items, the collection of product items, was the diapers and beer. And here you can see two researchers from the area, one of them given a gift, diapers and beer, to the developer of the best algorithm in terms of, I don't know, performance uh, time, <clears throat> which is able to find such patterns in the data. What kind of data we mean here? Uh, those are transaction data and they can be in represented as binary tables, also in transaction database format, or maybe in vertical database format. But in essence, we have transaction IDs, one, two, three, four, five, six customers, for example, or the same customer on different days, doesn't matter. And uh, five items, A, B, C, D, E. One means that a particular person or a particular transaction contains a particular item. Here is just the same reformulation, but we have a transaction ID and also an operator I, which uh, results in the, uh, in the set of items that were bought in 
particular transaction. And similarly for vertical databases, we have operator T, which says uh, what are the transactions where a particular item was bought. It closely related to inverse indices in information retrieval. But uh, let's have a look at the result of uh, the search performed by one of the algorithms like a priori for finding such frequent patterns. For example, we have item B, which was bought six times in a particular transaction database. So we also have item sets that were bought five times. So at least five customers bought uh, together B and E four times uh, for this collection of item sets. ABE, for example, was bought three times. The minimal threshold uh, here uh, for the number of such purchases is called minimal support. And uh, the structure which lies behind, the fundamental structure that lies behind is the lattice which is the lattice of closed item sets or um, the concept lattice as we call it in formal concept analysis. I will talk about it a bit later. So here we have uh, some items with the same supports like A, it has been, it was bought in um, four transactions and also ABE, it was also bought in the same four transactions and such, um, such classes form mm, the partition. Those are equivalence classes. Actually, they have a unique representative, the closed item set. In terms of support, it cannot be extended without violation um, the maximality of support here in the respective class. And there are also the so-called minimal generators, but they are not necessarily unique. They, you may think of them as uh, proper subsets of closed sets, uh, which cannot be further, um, uh, further diminished. Um, okay. Uh, what you can read in this, um, textbook by Zaki and Mayra on data mining that the concept of closed item sets is based on the elegant lattice theoretical framework of formal concept analysis by Gunther and Wille and we'll use this as a main tool for enumeration later. Um, also I would like to mention some some works related works uh, where not only such concept lattices are used, but also partition lattices. And we can show that uh, partition lattices can be represented as concept lattices. Partition lattices may, may be considered as a search spaces for clusters. Um, if we solve the problem of partitioning or community detection in SNA, they also can be used for granular computing or to build for building functional dependencies in relational databases and even for a variation of binary data analysis which is called independence uh, data analysis here are some of the links but let's go uh, to to the theoretical motivation which dates back to the problem <clears throat> of Rota, which was published in, Journal of the, in the Journal of Combinatorial Theory. Uh, he states the problem as follows. It's well known that for a Boolean lattice, uh, the largest size of anti-chain, that is uh, the family of sets which are not subsets of each other pairwise, is given by the middle binomial coefficient and uh, he proposed to prove or disprove the, fo the following generalization of this theorem. Whether for the partition lattice uh, the size of the largest anti-chain uh, coincides with the sterling number of the second kind. 
So that was his proposal. And since uh, the name of Emmanuel Sperner was mentioned, uh, it's a good time to, to mention that uh, Emmanuel Sperner studied Boolean lattices and uh, he formulated a theorem which proves that the central binomial coefficient uh, gives the size of maximum anti-chain of uh, elements or sets in the Boolean lattice. <clears throat> Here you can see two such anti-chains for the case of three element sets in, in red and in blue. And in its turn, the problem studied by Emmanuel Sperner dates back to the problem uh, posed by Richard Didekind on the number of anti-chains in Boolean lattice. So um, the first one is the beginning of the 19th century and the last one is the end of the beginning of 20th century and the last one is the end of the 19th century. Um, as for partition lattices, a lot has been done already by the end of uh, 70s and in the paper by uh, Ron Ronald uh, Graham, uh, for example, the co-author of Donald Knut on the famous book, Concrete Mathematics, uh, he has summarized the state of the art by that time. You can see the partition lattice on four elements from his paper. Here you can see, for example, the level anti-chains here, for example, and here by R. Um, the sets of elements of a certain rank are shown. So um, we will also use uh, this terminology in slightly modified manner later. And what he uh, told us in this paper is as follows, that uh, at most for n less or equal to 20, uh, the size of the largest anti-chain coincide with the sterling number of the second kind. And unfortunately, we do not know whether discrepancy arises, but this discrepancy exists. And um, I'm sorry. And Rodney Canfield showed that um, the largest anti-chain actually is not the level anti-chain, so it does not coincide with the largest, with the longest level in such a lattice. Um, according to Canfield, discrepancy may arise um, for n, which is very big. And uh, Ron Graham, Graham uh, says that, that, that we will never know uh, where it should happen. But uh, at least Canfield and one of his and uh, Graham Cofers Harper, they showed uh, what is the size of such an anti-chain asymptotically uh, from below together with Harper as far as I remember and from above, that's the latest result by Canfield, but already in 1998. So the theorem says um, that the size of such maximum anti-chain divided by the sterling number of uh, the second kinds and maximal for the specific n lies between these two values where a is given as, as a constant is given as follows. And um, this paper contains the following statement. The symbols C1, C2, the constants here, for example, they denote positive real con constants and it would be possible to find them but destructing to replace these by explicit values. So is Canfield right is the main question in the title of the paper. Uh, just tell us that we need to have a look at that, these numbers, what they are. And we are going to use uh, also um, representations of partition lattices as cross tables or formal contexts known in 
an applied branch of more than lattice fury. Uh, so here you can see cross table uh, representing this partition lattice, but instead of this second level where the partitions of three elements should be given, we have only pairs of elements which are together in one block. It is done deliberately. Okay, what are the problems here to address? For first, what is the size of the largest anti-chain for a given n? The problem was solved by um, Canfield asymptotically. Um, and a few numbers, few beginning numbers are known. We counted them explicitly. As for the number of anti-chains and maximal anti-chains, we also can count, uh, can count them explicitly, uh, not asymptotically, but asymptotically it's also possible depending on this DP. The first proposition says us what are the constants the constants are obtained from the first order conditions um, for this function. Uh, this function. So it has its maximum and minimum on the left. Uh, it has maximum n2. And x minimum is given by this n in integers. That's not integer if we compute it directly. And if a little bird would tell us where the discrepancy arises, uh, we can refine the coefficients nicely. Uh, you may think that this is not a little bird, but just an oracle. Okay, uh, we can also, we can find these coefficients, uh, but in terms of inequalities, uh, using the first order conditions. Moreover, uh, since uh, Canfield used this substitution for n in the original computations, we can use it as well, and we can use the principal branch of uh, Lambert W function, which is given here as a graph, <clears throat> and refine these coefficients even for n greater than 1. So these coefficients C1 with a wave and C2 with a tilde. Okay. Um, so the proof is given here. So we simply took mm, the final expression from the paper by Canfield and Harper and made the corresponding substitutions using our knowledge about the maximum value, that is first order condition. And similarly for the upper bound, and we used the form of the function and the Lambert function as well. Here, Bn, the rotated Bn, means bell number. It gives us the size of the whole partition lattice, the number of all partitions for a given n. Um, there are two remarks that we can recover this coefficient even for n uh, greater or equal 1. That is, uh, Canfield didn't consider n equals 1, uh, but we can do that because of direct usage of Lambert W function. And similar propositions uh, can be formulated for zero discrepancy intervals that is up to n20 as Graham uh, reported. The results of our computations, uh, of direct computations with algorithms from formal concept analysis, uh, both confirmed the results for the number of anti-chains in the partition lattice and for the number of maximum anti-chains in the partition lattice. This sequence was added by us and accepted by the OS editors. Um, Neil Sloan. So we somehow extended the state of the art and confirmed uh, the known values. But what was the machinery? We used this binary representation. We used the 
resulting concept lattice. The numbers here uh, are just binary codes, uh, and you may think that they are IDs of the nodes in the lattice. And we order them according to this relation and build another lattice, and this is the lattice of anti-chains. And if we simply remove the equality side from here, like here, I'm sorry, yeah, remove it, then the diagonal will appear. We obtain the lattice of maximal anti-chains in the partition lattice, and this is the case for N3. So for larger lattices, it's a fast-growing sequence. It takes a lot of time, and uh, here you can see, for example, that from milliseconds for some of the beginning ends, for N6, we already spent more than a month, and our computation um, did not finish, but at that time, now it, it, we have some progress, but it's not finished yet. Here, there are some graphs, sorry, for a small uh, scale. Uh, we compare the number of maximal anti-chains in Boolean lattice and in the partition lattice. For N6, this red dot is somewhere here, what we are trying to reach. Uh, maybe it's better to have a look at these figures in the paper already. Um, but we also try to formulate some inequalities bounding the number of anti-chains in the partition lattice from below and the number of maximal anti-chains uh, anti from above. We used the level-wise uh, partition of the partition lattice into anti-chains, so that's why we have uh, this summoned here, mainly. Uh, but we also use um, interlevel anti-chains, meaning that if we have uh, different levels, the elements, the sets of different ranks in uh, the corresponding partition lattice, we can consider anti-chains from different levels and somehow improve those values. Actually, the improvements are good only for beginning values, so here, delta means uh, the discrepancy between the number of anti-chains and maximal anti-chains, and the L and the L plus uh, are our inequalities. So for one to three, this is, up, as this is uh, zero relative error, but for four, the maximum that we could get is zero uh, point 32 for 5, 0 0.57, so we need to count more elements. And as an illustration, I would like to mention the case for N4. Here you can see the binary representation of the corresponding mm, partition lattice, or even two layers of the original partition lattice. And here we consider this relation on its partition, partition, and we can count 30 patterns or 30, 30 concepts or anti-chains, maximal anti-chains. And if we add two more, we exactly obtain the number of maximal anti-chains in the original lattice. Also using uh, the tool, which is called lattice minor. We can build the concept lattice diagram, sometimes called Hasse diagram, uh, but Hasse was not the first who used this name, so line diagram is a bit safe to say here. And this diagram can help us to extract all the other anti-chains, not only maximal by hand. Uh, so we inspect those uh, those concepts. We consider different bipartite graphs, say with three and one vertices in different parts, uh, extracted from the corresponding concepts of the corresponding levels. So here, for example, you can see uh, that in one part there are two nodes, uh, and in the other part there are also two nodes, but they are given as the corresponding partitions names. 
and we can uh, sum all the total counters here and also we should work not only with the concept represent concepts represented in this lattice but in but also with uh, proper sub bipartite subgraphs not only maximal uh, bipartite subgraphs they are formal concepts and count uh, the types of anti chains represented by bipartite graphs to one k to one k one two Nitri, I'm sorry k one uh, oh, yeah? but your time was over three minutes ago okay the last slide here uh, when we sum it up, we obtain 344 uh, patterns, and we also need to include uh, this partition where all elements are in, and this partitions where each element in a separate block. And if you ask me about a single formula to compute it, you can find it here as well. Uh, unfortunately, the time is over. And I'm only ready to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Ignatov, would you like to ask any other question? <laughs> from my side, no questions, but we are expecting the questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. and then I have a question. Yeah. Can I ask you my question? So. Uh, I like your theoretical uh, work, it is very interesting for me, but uh, our conference, uh, you can uh, agree with me that your topic is uh, quite borderline according to this conference, so please, uh, could you explain in more detail uh, the um, machine learning applications of your uh, high-level theory in two words? Yeah, uh, so I would rather think about this topic and this direction as not theory for machine learning, but machine learning, and I would even say data mining and formal concept analysis oh, for yeah. combinatorics. So we can take algorithms from data mining for enumeration of closed item sets, and we can um, compute uh, these values, which are not yet known, at least in the OEAs, mm -hmm. and um, extend our knowledge. Maybe someday a new Euler will come and give us a nice formula, but so far machine learning helps us, mm -hmm. and data mining, I would say, helps us to find this number, at least scrape them from the data. Hey, the data thank you, thank you very much. Uh, such a nice cooperation between two uh, fields of the theoretical informatics. Um, yeah, and yes. it's re really my pleasure to contribute to this section, which you chair uh, many years, I believe. And thank you very thank much. You, thank you very much. Thank you. Very, very interesting presentation. Thank you. I so, there are some questions from the audience. Uh, I don't know, M M Mikhail, whether you can see. Uh -huh. Okay. I have a question. Uh, your title includes a question, is cancel right? So to summarize, is he right or not? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit provocative question to, to attract attention to this kind of problem, because um, if you check, there were no progress since the beginning of millennium because Canfield solved the problem theoretically asymptotically mm -hmm. but these coefficients should we know them should we try to know them uh, is a very good answer which can stimulate us so Canfield decided at that time that they are distracting but we try to to find them out and uh, maybe if we can uh, can prove uh, theorems about uh, the concrete n where discrepancy arises, we can refine this coefficient, uh, coefficients. Mm -hmm. And at least we know what is the gap. And this is nice. It might be like a competition. A new mathematician or practitioner will come and uh, refine it more in, in a more elaborated way. 
Окей. Максим Панов here would like to ask question. Yeah, uh, so uh, I'm, I have also, I don't know, probably funny question, not really related to the topic. Uh, you had one of the slides where you were referring to some book or foundational paper where there were three authors, but you strike one out. Why? Uh, it's also a funny story. Uh, the original book on formal concept analysis, mathematical foundation, is offered by Bernard Gunter, one of my supervisors from the German side, and by uh, his uh, supervisor, Rudolf Wille, who passed away. Then they translated it into English. Uh, the translator was Franzke, and <laughs> um, some of uh, the systems indexed uh, Franzke, but his contribution was not actually as an author, but as a translator. And in the community, we discussed it many times. Uh, we decided uh, not, not, to <laughs> not to give uh, his name, but at least I decided to give his name, but strike it out. Sorry. <laughs> so any colleagues, we, we should proceed with our program. Thank you. Thank you very much once again. And our uh, second spe speaker will be Maxim Panov uh, with his presentation about distributed by Bolshan corsets. You're welcome, Maxim, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, yeah, that's my pleasure today to present this work. Um, that was essentially a master thesis, which was def defended a year ago by my student, Vladimir Milusik. So, uh, well, it would be more essential if he would be presenting this work, but uh, uh, he's currently a PhD student in University of uh, Missouri, and it's, well, not feasible both to travel here and also to, um, to, to speak online because the timing is not very good. So uh, I will be presenting on his behalf partially, but also on my behalf. Okay, so uh, the topic here is um, basically the inspiration for this topic is uh, Bayesian approach to machine learning. And uh, well, we consider the standard parametric model uh, like probabilistic, probabilistic parametric model where you have an input X, you have output Y, you have a certain probability distribution which is parameterized by some parameter vector theta. So it might be linear regression, might be neural network, it might be whatever. And uh, usually we consider the situation when we are given with a data set, so pairs X and Y, so your historical observations. And then uh, people write a likelihood function which basically is joint density of Ys. Joint, uh, joint probability of Ys, and uh, usually it's convenient uh, to rewrite it uh, via log likelihood functions. Uh, so, and basically then the total likelihood is the exponent of uh, sum of log likelihoods for individual data points. Well, I'm writing it here because for my future uh, task it will be important, so su such a representation. And in the Bayesian approach, um, you usually assume that there exists some prior distribution on the weight, defined as P0 on my slide. And uh, then if you have, a, uh, you have a likelihood and you have a prior distribution, then you can write a posterior. So the posterior uh, is given by this formula, so you have a product, so it's bias formula, well known, and uh, you have this product of likelihood and prior, and then you have a normalizing constant in the denominator, which is basically just an integral over the theta. Um, and um, well, if you think about some machine learning model behind that, what you are eventually are interested in, you are interested in making predictions. So, and uh, for this, people usually employ in this Bayesian constant, people usually employ so-called uh, posterior predictive distribution where you average likelihood at a new point uh, over your posterior. And in, um, in practice, usually, of course, you can't compute this integral explicitly and people do sampling like Monte Carlo approach. Um, and I also should mention that, uh, that because you have very rich object potentially, the posterior distribution, then you are not like 
constrained by just looking on expectation. You can you can look on the moments of this distribution, on the variance, on other moments. So basically, you can also reason about uncertainty, and that's why generally Bayesian approach to machine learning um, is thought to be like an interesting thing because you not just do a point prediction, but also you can uh, can do certain uncertainty quantification. Um, however, uh, these formulas are a bit problematic uh, because uh, of uh, different things. So uh, the mainstream, I would say, problem which people consider is that actually the numerator, uh, uh, sorry, denominator, uh, is uh, very problematic to compute. So numerator is given, you have, you have some prior, you have a likelihood, it's all given, uh, but in uh, denominator you have something which is an integral, and this integral is hard to compute, usually. So of course there exist cases like case of conjugate distributions when it's easy to compute, but in general case it's, it's hard to compute and people consider various approaches uh, to, to sample from this distribution or to approximate this distribution. So uh, most well-known are Monte, uh, Markov chain, Monte Carlo, and variational inference. However, in fact, uh, if you consider like modern applications, when you have a lot of data, like think of uh, modern like image classifiers, uh, which are trained on millions of data, or think of probably language models, which are trained on trillions of data, uh, there is another part, which is uh, actually might become complicated to compute. That's likelihood itself. Why? Because the summation is very large. So you have many, many summons, and then imagine you want to do Markov chain Monte Carlo on top. What, what, what is Markov chain Monte Carlo? You iteratively do, try different points until you get something which is accepted and which is your generated sample. And uh, well, this process requires to evaluate likelihood very many times. And if it's N is million or billion or trillion, it might be very, very hard to compute. Uh, and that's why uh, in the research community it was considered uh, like certain approach which is called core sets. Uh, basically what you do, uh, you consider the weighted likelihood. So you introduced weights WI and you want to construct these weights in such a way that first you have many zeros among the weights. So you reduce the summation. And second, that this posterior is close to the initial posterior. Okay, so you want to select some subset of points which approximate, possibly weighted, so it might be not zero, one, it might be something else, but you want to have many zeros and you have, want to have a small subset of points which well approximates your uh, initial uh, distribution. And then, if you succeed with this task, then you will be able to do your computations very, very quickly. I mean, if, if, if number of non-zero uh, Ws is small. Well, uh, basically, a little bit the same notation again. I'm sorry, I just want to mention that uh, we almost, in the experiments later, we almost wouldn't consider the, uh, the problem of supervised learning, which motivated the problem. And we mostly will consider the problem of density estimation and sampling from this density. So uh, that's why I'm writing just as I have just X here. But essentially, it doesn't change the formula for posterior. And, uh, well, there exists quite established literature on the construction of a core sets, including Bayesian core sets. And actually, all the algorithms we are aware of, uh, they follow more or less uh, the same structure. So what you do, uh, you, um, you introduce some distance uh, between uh, uh, the log likelihood functions. And uh, one possible distance might be expectation of the posterior over the posterior of a difference of local likelihood function. Um, yeah, and then what you do, you want to find the weights which minimize this distance between the full posterior and your weighted one under the constraint that you want to have not more than k non-zero weights. So that's a certain optimization problem it, of course, depending on likelihoods here, it can have kind of a different complexity. Uh, however, uh, well, that's a, that's a general approach. One useful notion which was introduced in the literature and which helps a lot is so-called notion of sensitivity. 
basically you look on the ra on the ratio between the likelihood of one point and all other points and uh, if this ratio is high then probably this point is important and you should include it if this ratio is low then uh, point is not important and you exclude it and to have but of course you have a free parameter theta here so you need to do something with it you can say okay my definition will be via supremum like the worst case or the best case depending on the look what is your contribution uh, to this likelihood uh, and uh, this notion is called sensitivity and the majority of uh, works they consider different algorithms based on these sensitivities of course uh, well it's a big question how you compute them i won't touch it in this talk well you do need to do some approximations and uh, basically uh, the works which uh, currently exist they have uh, they basically uh, have two main parts first one you can either can do iterative methods which gathers the core set step by step so you choose one point you choose another point you choose third point and so on or you do sampling uh, so if you do sampling uh, it's actually pretty easy you sample random points uh, with probabilities that are proportional to sensitivities so and then you get something in uh, in sequential approaches you try to choose the point which improves your current score the most and you do it one by one and the two, two and the main difference between the methods who are iterative is whether you try to like solve if you consider this functional exactly or you may try to convexify this constraint somehow okay um, and the question which we asked in this research is well the the iterative approaches they in fact give uh, pretty good performance and practice usually but they might be very slow because you choose points one by one you have a huge data you probably your final core set will be much smaller than whole the data but still pretty large so the process can be slow can we parallelize it and uh, uh, in the literature there were considered like some works uh, which uh, we're doing this parallelization for non-Bayesian cassettes, which consider just approximation of likelihood without any posterior. And we wanted to do something for this Bayesian approach. So, uh, and basically, uh, well, very simple idea. Actually, uh, the idea of this work is, uh, is pretty simple. That what we want to do, we will be sampling. So we have a data and we will be sampling a points from it based on the likelihood values. So we have some, say, maximum likelihood or maximum posteriori estimate of the parameters. We plug it in and we sample points proportional, without replacement, proportionally to, uh, to the ratio, which we obtain for this theta hat maximum likelihood. And basically, uh, we expect then uh, that on different, um, so, uh, and what you actually do? You sample several points for the first computer, for, uh, so we do distributed computation, then several points for second and so on. And hopefully they will be sampled in a way that sort of form clusters. So first you probably will sample the most probable points for the second, the less probable points will go and so on. Uh, yeah, so that's some. Um, yeah, so once again, we have several, several workers or processors or computers. Uh, we, we will do corset selection on each of them separately. So first we sample points, then we do corset selection for them separately, and then we merge the resulting corset. And each of them has a size of a corset K over the number of workers. So, um, well, what are the results? So we, in this work, we considered, well, very pretty uh, simple examples. So we start from just uh, density estimation in Gaussian data, which is very simplistic. First, let me explain you uh, the, which algorithms are compared. So we have three algorithms. So one is a baseline iterative approach called, I don't know why called sequential here, but well, it's, uh, it's a synonym. Uh, and then we have uh, two uh, distributed approaches. One is based on a random splitting, and the other one is based on our, well, we call it machine learning split, you know, our sampling proportional to, to something, to, to sensitivities. 
And uh, we, we present two plots. First of all, on the x-axis, we increase the size of a corset. And on y-axis, we compute the KL divergence, so the distance, the smaller the better. And on the second plot, we, uh, uh, we represent time computed in seconds here. So basically what we see is that for the multivariate Gaussian example, so, uh, well, very simple problem, of course. And uh, we observe that here sequential approach works better. So our distributed approaches, when we distribute and then merge, they, they work worse. Um, however, well, as expected, they, they work much faster. So here I think we had seven or eight cores uh, working in parallel. Then more interesting things start to happen. So if we look on the Gaussian mixture, uh, first univariate Gaussian mixture, then already uh, the distributed methods, they start to beat the sequential approach. Why? Because sequential approach is greedy. And uh, what I expect that, uh, well, probably we need to do a little bit more in-depth analysis, but what, what I think that basically different cores they uh, successfully approximate pretty accurately uh, different uh, modes of our mixture. So each of them becomes good at one mode, uh, while this one is jumping from mode to mode and something weird happens. So, and uh, here already we see certain improvement over the random split by ML approach. And, uh, well, computationally, we see there is a big difference in speed compared to the sequential one. Then we can see that multivariate Gaussian mixture. Uh, here it's more or less the same story. Pretty good gap between sequential and ML and, uh, and, uh, and the distributed approaches and a certain benefit of using better sampling. Uh, and the probably the final plot which I wanted to show, that's uh, a bit different. That's already supervised learning. So there was a some classification problem. And what we do, we report the resulting accuracy of classification. So what you do, you make a core set, and then you, uh, you use some Bayesian model for classification based on this core set, right? So instead of full likelihood, you use a weighted likelihood. And what we report here now, it's not a KL divergence, but our downstream quality, so the accuracy, right? Well, what is nice that at least accuracy is improving with core set size, so we sort of get more information. And uh, also what we see is that interestingly, uh, the uh, distributed approaches are doing kind of better than the sequential one. So again, we actually benefit from distribution, no, not only in terms of time, but also in terms of quality. Uh, and probably the final plot I wanted to show is, uh, is the dependence on the number of the processors used. So, uh, generally, what we see is that you can get an improvement when you increase the number of processors. There are some fluctuation here, not sure why, but generally we see the trend for improvement. And uh, also, well, you see the improvement in time. The more processors you have, you, you improve uh, your computations, or apparently diminishing returns. So it's not linear. Well, everyone would be happy if it's linear, decrease in time, but it's like, in fact, it's not. So there is certain overhead. Well, that's the same. So, and well, to summarize, uh, so we, I think really, as you've seen, we really scratched the surface. Uh, however, uh, generally my motivation to start this work was actually to use these Bayesian core sets for actual uh, computations, for example, with neural networks. Because currently Bayesian neural networks, well, you can find many papers and top conferences, but eventually you see that there are little to no benefit from their usage because uh, it's either, uh, so, uh, because usually you can't, um, uh, you can't apply them to really meaningful data sets. So you, you take almost any Bayesian neural network paper and you end up classifying MNIST. Uh, not anything like ImageNet or something like that. Why? Well, you need to do MCMC over rational inference on hundreds of thousands of parameters on millions of examples. That just no, doesn't work. So, and I think that here we need a kind of a combined approach. So we, we need to use core sets, we need to use parallelization, and we need to some advanced variational inference or MCMC algorithms. So that's uh, some 
very small step in this direction. So I think I'm done, and thank you for your attention. Большое спасибо. Коллеги, пожалуйста, задавайте... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, please um, ask your questions to the speaker. Thank you for interesting talk. In the beginning, uh, you were talking about uh, the distribution of parameters, prior distribution. So how you choose this distribution? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. That's actually the question I think uh, everyone not from Bayesian community is, ask, is asking all the time. And there is no like a final answer on that. So uh, th there exist different approaches. One of the approaches that you try to, uh, to use the distribution which is like uh, disturbing your uh, your likelihood as, as, as small as possible. So I, I forgot the name in, in, in English, but basically something which has actually very flat. So something which doesn't uh, like uh, put you somewhere. Uh, in, and I think it's kind of a reasonable approach for, uh, for large scale applications when you actually don't have any idea. However, I also should mention that for modern uh, like say, modern models like neural networks, generally the question what should be good prior is, is very, very open. Why? Because, well, putting a prior on each weight from 100,000 being some Gaussian, well, does it make much sense? It's not very clear. And the final point here is that on some like smaller scale applications, sometimes people have kind of a domain knowledge. So if you have a I don't know, linear or logistic regression, then the practitioners might have some idea what kind of uh, uh, weight should be for the particular factor. Then you can have some Gaussian around this value on some, or I don't know, uniform distribution on some segment, and, and you can use that. Thank uh, you. Any more questions? Okay. Maybe. Maybe one question on terminology. I like the term core set, but maybe you know about its origination, mm -hmm. why these two words? Uh, that's a very good question. Actually, I, do, uh, I don't remember the paper where it was introduced, so I, I will need to look. So actually this area is, is relatively rich and there are more general definition of core sets. For example, here I used only weights but, but sometimes people want to have a kind of a synthetic examples. So you, you, you start to tune your X so that uh, you can approximate the whole likelihood with a few points. So generally it's a kind of a broad topic. Well, I will do my research and, and, and send you where it originated from. Excuse me, colleagues. Can I talk some words about uh, answer uh, of the Dr. Ignata? Go ahead, so please. It, it seems to me um, that uh, this concept, core set, initially was uh, introduced in computational geometry mm -hmm. in the con constant context of Bernimal Goodrich approximation algorithms uh, for the so called heating set problem. So it is very, very interesting combinatorial optimization and computational geometry problem. So it's uh, very interesting for me as a specialist in computer optimization to listen to your presentation because uh, it, it is also uh, one more uh, um, proof of uh, the deep cooperation between machine learning and computer optimization. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you, Mikhail. It seems there are no more questions in the audience. Okay. Thank you again. And uh, now we, sorry? I think we have an online talk, right? Yes, yes. Uh, we, we can proceed with our final talk, the, least, uh, but not, uh, the last but not the least, by uh, Professor Eduard Hodinovich Gimadi and uh, Alexander Stepa.
the, on the problem of finding several given diameter spanning trees of maximum total weight in a complete graph. So uh, it seems to me Alexander will be the speaker. Alexander, yes. you can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I just. So you're welcome. Please. Screen. Okay. Hello, my name is Alexander Stepa, and I want to present our work with uh, Dorat Hardinich Dimadi about the problem of finding several uh, given diameter spanning trees of maximum total weight in a complete graph. First of all, let's formulate this problem. Uh, we have arbitrary edge weighted complete undirected graph G and positive integers M and D, which uh, satisfies the following uh, inequality. And we want to find M joint spanning trees T1, Tm of the maximum total weight of edges in these trees and diameter equals D. Uh, let's uh, let us remind the uh, the diameter of a tree is the maximum number of edges within the tree connecting a pair of vertices. Uh, this uh, work is based on two works by us, which was published in 2022 and 2023 in the work from uh, in the work uh, uh, 2022. Uh, we consider uh, one maximum um, weight uh, spanning tree with a given diameter. And in the work of uh, 2023, we consider several edges join spanning trees, but uh, for minimization problem. And we want to reduce our problem with several uh, maximum spanning trees to the minimum uh, case. And it uh, 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 done uh, by using statement from uh, the, this work. Uh, we have two graphs, G and G prime. Uh, in graph G, uh, there is a uh, weight function uh, W E, and in graph G prime, uh, W uh, prime E. And T is a tree with, uh, with total weight, uh, which is calculated with uh, W prime, uh, then and only then, if if it's a tree with such uh, such weight constructed in original graph G, and uh, weights of uh, function weights uh, are linked by this relation. So uh, we apply uh, algorithm from the work of twenty twenty three. Uh, where we can uh, we solve the minimization problem, so we have input output of this algorithm and some steps. Uh, let us uh, describe them by the example, and uh, we prove uh, in this work was proved uh, the feasibility of the algorithm and the time complexity of this algorithm. So uh, we have initial complete graph. I want to describe uh, the steps of uh, uh, this algorithm. And we have two uh, uh, spanning trees we, which I want to construct and a diameter of each tree is equal to five. So we choose uh, two uh, subsets, V1, V2, with uh, D plus one uh, vertices and all other vertices we put in V prime. On the first step we construct um, Hamiltonian path using a heuristic go to the nearest unvisited vertex. Uh, of course, it's not exact solution, it's just approximate solution. And uh, then we divide each path into halves and connect a first half uh, of the first path with the first half of the second path by the shortest stage uh, with inner vertices. Then uh, second uh, half of first path uh, by the shortest stage uh, within the vertices of uh, second half of the second pass. So we do it in a parallel manner. And then we construct, we uh, connect this pass uh, using a cross manner. So we uh, co connect uh, first uh, uh, half of second pass with second pass, uh, second half of first pass and uh, second half of uh, second uh, pass with first half of uh, first pass. It's uh, done to avoid uh, the possible dependency of uh, random variable during uh, work of algorithm. If we uh, just connect in, in uh, another way, we can 
uh, consider one edge twice and it will broke the uh, independence property of uh, random variables. And on the third pass, uh, third step, we uh, uh, connect, we uh, uh, add edges from uh, V prime uh, and connect the, uh, them again with the shortest pass to inner vertices of uh, corresponding trees. Uh, of course, it's uh, obvious that we connect with inner vertex uh, because inner vertex uh, because we do not want to uh, increase the diameter of uh, constructed tree. So, if you connect with inner vertex, uh, the, the maximum uh, distance between trees uh, will be on the path. Uh, uh, but it was a description of algorithm for minimization problem. We want to solve the maximization problem, and this done by uh, changing the weight function of graph G uh, to weight function V prime, obtaining graph G prime, and apply algorithm A prime to the graph G prime. Uh, so we on step uh, two we uh, solve the minimization problem and uh, the constructed spanning trees T1 TM a solution for the maximization problem. And again, uh, in this work, we prove feasibility of this algorithm and time complexity. Since a change of weight function uh, can be done in O from N squared, and uh, as was uh, mentioned previously, uh, step, uh, the second step is uh, performed in O from N squared uh, time. So the total time complexity of algorithm I is O from N squared two. Uh, there are some uh, notations that must be introduced uh, by f a uh, f sub a from i and opt from i. We denote respectively the uh, approximate obtained by some approximation algorithm uh, and optimal value of objective function of the problem on input i. And uh, we said that algorithm uh, a have uh, performance guarantees epsilon delta if such uh, inequality holds. Uh, where epsilon is an estimation of relative error and delta is the failure of probability, which is equal to the proportion of cases when the algorithm does not hold the relative error epsilon or does not produce any answer at all. And we say that approximation algorithm is asymptotically optimal on the class of input data if epsilon and delta uh, tends to infinity as it tends to zero as uh, n uh, tends to infinity. And it's uh, quite common. Uh, a common definition for probabilistic analysis, and we want to uh, prove that algorithm I is asymptotically optimal. So it means that uh, epsilon and delta goes uh, to zero as uh, n goes to infinity. Uh, there are some uh, qualities which are used in the probabilistic analysis. If we denote random variable equal to minimum of k variables from the uni zero one by xk and uh, uh, w prime from uh, a prime be the total wage of trees t1 tm constructed by uh, algorithm a prime so uh, it's obvious that uh, this uh, w prime a prime will be equal to sum of uh, uh, sum of uh, weights which are added on the uh, first, second, and the third um, steps of algorithm A prime. So on the first uh, step, we uh, just uh, use uh, heuristic go to the nearest nearest unlisted vertex. So on the first step, we have uh, D possibilities because uh, set contain D plus one vertices, then D minus one, and etc. To uh, k equal to one, where we find uh, the minimum over one h, and uh, this repeated n times. On the second uh, step, we consider all the pairs between uh, all the pairs of paths and uh, construct edges uh, connecting them. So uh, we have a um, uh, multiplicator C. Uh, from um, uh, C M two, uh, and uh, then uh, connect uh, for possibilities for edges and for end vertices. 
the, the first summand is for uh, paths, and uh, the second one is for uh, end vertices. And on the third step, uh, we repeat m times uh, the connection of each uh, from n minus m multiplied by d plus one vertices from uh, set of v prime and uh, connect them by the shortest edge to uh, uh, to inner vertices. And uh, there are d minus one uh, inner vertices in each path. And according to statement which was uh, mentioned on the second slide, we have obtained such uh, equality, which uh, connect uh, the weight of graph uh, the weight uh, the weight of result of graph uh, A and uh, the weight of result of algorithm A prime. And uh, we prove uh, the lemma, which postulated. Uh, postulates uh, the uh, epsilon and delta for our algorithm A for uh, problem uh, for, for maximization problem and the crucial uh, statement for our analysis is uh, theorem by Petrov which consider in, uh, independent random variables x1 xn and uh, introduce constants t h1 hn uh, which are satisfy the following inequality and if you set s equals to sum of sum of xk and h sum of hk small uh, we can uh, obtain such probabilistic inequality which will be help uh, will, uh, which helps uh, uh, to uh, carry out our uh, probabilistic analysis and uh, there are some uh, statements some lemmas from uh, work uh, from our work uh, uh, 2023. Uh, in the first lemma, we prove that uh, condition of Petrov theorem uh, holds. Uh, and in the uh, second lemma, we uh, bound uh, H big from above. And in the third lemma, we uh, construct the upper bound for mathematical expectation of uh, weight uh, which uh, get by algorithm A prime. Uh, so uh, we uh, reduce uh, the problem of maximization to the problem of minimization and uh, use some results for um, the minimization problem. And the main result of our work is that uh, if D is equal uh, or greater than logarithm n, then we get the following uh, failure probability and the relative error. As you can see, uh, failure probability is uh, immediately uh, tends to uh, uh, zero if n goes to infinity. But uh, for epsilon, it must be uh, considered the case when d is uh, uh, d goes to infinity as n goes to infinity. Uh, as uh, in the case of d uh, greater or equal than logarithm n. And it must be noted that uh, similar results, uh, result obtained for uni in, uh, a, n, a sub n, b sub n, uh, since we can always uh, reduce the problem with uh, arbitrary a, a, n and b n, which holds this uh, inequalities uh, by uh, reduce this problem to uh, normalized uh, random variables which are distributed on the interval from zero to one and in contrast to the case of minimization problem there is no need to impose additional condition on the scatter of h weights like was in the work uh, of 2023 and as a conclusion, we can say that we generalized have generalized result from work of 2022 for one maximum spanning trees with given diameter to several joint spanning trees and use uh, uh, algorithm from this work, uh, which has a time complexity O from n square and uh, applied it uh, to our case with modified weight function. And for continuous uniform distribution of H weights on interval zero one, we can uh, get an analogous result follows from uh, continuous 
uniform distribution of H rates on interval uh, A sub N, B sub N, uh, as I said previously. And it will be interesting to investigate this problem on discrete distributions. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, colleagues, would you like to ask some questions? To Alexander. It seems there are no questions. In this case, I would like to, to ask some small question. Yes, yes. Uh, so, uh, Alexander, your um, brilliant work seems to me uh, is a nice, another nice example of um, cooperation between uh, machine learning and computer optimization. And uh, this um, field uh, developed by Professor Gimadi and you seems to me very, very, very interesting in uh, the case of our um, millennium problem about P and NP. So Thank that's you. very, very interesting. And the um, question is as follows. Um, in your proof, you use uh, Petrov's theorem. Mm -hmm which uh, appears to be a classic um, measure concentration result and uh, classical result. Uh, since that result, there are many more novel results, uh, more strong uh, measure concentration results. Would you like to um, incorporate them in, in your framework? It will be very interesting. Uh, I'm not uh, professional in this uh, domain, but I think we just uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We should uh, watch uh, other oh, projects. Okay. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So, other questions, please? Oh. Unfortunately, no questions. Oh, it seems to me that all are clear. So we can we we should send our presenter once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, dear colleagues, uh, I should unfortunately I should close our session. Thank you uh, for you all uh, for a very interesting presentation and for the attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikhail. Thank you. Okay, dear colleagues, I'm just reminding that the parallel session is still going on, so we can go there. And also, in one hour, there will be a poster session, so you'll have some interesting posters, so please attend. <laughs>